morning. The board is in session and we're going to hear more budget requests. And uh, so we'll turn the time over to our controller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner. Yes. Good morning. We're going to start with the uh, pest and mosquito. Adam Schroeder is the director of Weed Control, Pest Abatement, and Me Mosquito Abatement. Noxious Weed Control enforces Idaho's noxious weed law and works to control or eradicate noxious weeds found within Ada County. There are currently 36 out of 76 state designated weed species found within Ada County. Pest abatement provides pest control services to landowners living within the pest abatement district. Pest abatement crews manage gopher and rock chuck infestations that threaten agriculture or infrastructure on public and private lands. Mosquito abatement provides mosquito surveillance, monitoring, and control services to taxpayers living within the mosquito abatement district. Mosquito abatement works within an integrated pest management plan to mitigate the impact of West Nile virus, viruses and other vector-borne diseases in Ada County. Weed is a special levy fund, part of that 3% cap off property taxes. Budget submitted for FY23 at $1,280,698. 165,000 over their appropriation total. There are uh, supplementals in the operating side. These are all ongoing costs. Fuel price increases of 50,000. Fleet replacement plans, so two vehicles per year at 100,000. And heavy equipment contractor at 15,000. <clears> Budget to actual from FY18 to current, and then the number of employees remaining consistent for several years at 14. Pest is one of your special taxing districts, so they have their own 3%. Budget for FY23 is submitted at 765272 right on their appropriation total, so therefore they have no supplementals. You can see their budget to actual history and the number of employees at two. Pest is one of the other special taxing districts that you have. Budget for FY23 <coughs> submitted at 1,477,370. 337, 100,000 over their appropriation total. And this is for a supplemental for the emergency aerial application and operations for 100,000. I'd like to introduce Adam Schroeder, who will present the budgets for these departments. Good morning, Adam. Thanks Thank for. You, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. How are you today? Happy Friday. Happy, happy Friday. Um, to begin, I'd like to thank the board for its time and consideration this morning and for the opportunity to present the weed pest and mosquito abatement proposed budgets for FY 2023. It is my honor to serve the citizens of Ada County in my role as director of these fine departments, and I'm humbled by your continued support and guidance. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Steve Rutherford for being incre an incredible ambassador for me and all of the department heads. Also, thanks to Kathleen, Tim, and Kobe for their help preparing this budget. I would also like at this time to recognize the employees of Weed Pest Mosquito who have continued to endure and strive to be better in all aspects of service to the county. They are outstanding people, and I am grateful to represent them today. I would especially like to thank Desiree Keeney and Diana Bame for their help with this presentation and for all of the work they do every day to keep us running. Uh, also, on behalf of the employees this morning, I would like to thank you for your consideration of any COLA merit um, increases in wage that you would consider uh, during this budget session. Um, I know that we have several of our folks who drive more than 60 miles a day to come to work for us. They live in Gem County, Payette County, um, Canyon County, uh, even Elmore County, and they uh, do everything they can to afford the gas to come to work for us. So. I know that anything that you guys, uh, that you as a board would uh, consider as far as COLA goes would be very well received and, and thank you for that consideration. Uh, I apologize uh, in advance. I know that uh, a lot of these slides are review for you, uh, commissioners, Mr. Chairman, um, but I think it's important to put into context uh, our funding sources and our uh, scope of services when we talk about these three departments so that we understand and we're measuring apples to apples when we talk about budget numbers. So here's an outline of what I prepared for you this morning. I will begin with a background for the agency. 
We will move on to reportables and budget requests for each department, followed by uh, some quick up updates on Alamo and our outreach efforts. Our agency is composed of three separate and distinct departments. The three departments share a facility and an administrative staff. We are one of very few agencies in the nation that has a structure where special taxing districts cohabitate with general fund departments in animal and insect abatement. Even though the business processes and legal requirements for, are each uh, different for each department, we can combine our resources and increase our capabilities, allow for greater efficiency, and get better results uh, with lower costs to the citizens of Ada County through our shared efforts. Weed Pest Mosquito has 22 full-time employees. There are nine full-time folks who work in noxious weed control, one full-time employee for the Pest Abatement District, and five full-time employees in Mosquito, seven and seven who were also funded out of all three departments. And that's why those numbers might look different from what Kathleen said. Ada County Noxious Weed Control is funded by a special levy within the general fund that is supplemented with enterprise fees that we collect performing noxious weed control services for private citizens, commercial businesses, and public agencies. We serve the entirety of Ada County, and our primary mission is to act as the enforcement agents for Idaho Noxious Weed Law um, and the Idaho State Department of Agriculture administrative rule sets. Along with enforcing the noxious weed law, our mission is to also provide effective noxious weed control services to the citizens of Ada County with the goal of enhancing our community's quality of life. The core values of our agency are humanity, excellence, integrity, trust, and stewardship. And those are shared throughout all three departments. So that'll be probably the last time I read those. Our directives are simple. We comply with all laws, rules, regulations, and codes, particularly as they pertain to the application of pesticides, as well as supporting the rights of property owners and holding folks accountable to responsible stewardship of their lands. We find and identify noxious weeds. We currently have 37 of 71 prohibited species occurring in Ada County. So once we find them, we make plans uh, to control each species according to a predefined set of actions and guidelines listed in our action plan. We also work to educate folks on the dangers of noxious weeds, how they damage our ecosystems, decrease biodiversity, and harm humans, livestock, pets, wildlife, agriculture, or property. We work to stay current with the science of noxious weed control, including pesticide te technology, herbicide resistance, GIS IT application, and integrated pest management methodologies. Finally, we always support our people in enriching them, their professional knowledge base and in the pursuit of their career goals. These directives have metrics that are listed in our strategic plan and are reported in our annual reports. I'd like to share with the board a few key statistics from fiscal year 2021. Uh, we took over 1,400 calls for weed control and created over 1,800 work orders, either by result of a phone call or other contact. We completed 14, uh, over 1,400 of those work orders on public and private lands. All said, we treated over 3,100 acres of noxious weed infestation throughout the county, and we collected nearly $200,000 in enterprise revenues. Uh, much of our work is based on noxious weed prevention, and our field techs and leads have years of experience providing quality herbicide recommendations and land management guidance to a wide range of constituents who have issues ranging from preventing puncture vine and horse corrals uh, to controlling Canada thistle and bindweed in public green spaces. The heat map on this slide illustrates where the demand from our services come, comes from. We get a lot of calls in the North Eagle area for semi-agricultural work along the Highway 44 corridor for a range of services, in Garden City, Boise, and Meridian for puncture vine control, and in Southern Ada County for pasture work. In terms of production, we mapped more than 330 new noxious weed infestations within the county. And you might notice that acronym EDRR, that stands for Early Detection Rapid Response. These are noxious weed infestations that are new to Ada County or are not currently established. EDRR infestations are our highest priority for control and eradication, and we currently have eight EDRR weed species that we are working on. We've documented over 300 noxious weed complaints from the public, sent 290 letters, 
and have created over 350 work orders from, that have stemmed from those complaints. So, Mr. Chairman, you might notice, or we are noticing a disturbing trend that um, uh, we're seeing at least one new EDRR species every year so far, and, and I think we can attribute that to the uh, large amount of immigration that we're seeing. Um, I want to thank Dr. Barbara Erder and Dr. Ann DeBolt, both who are well-regarded botanists, for identifying and reporting an infestation of Kogan grass growing near Camelsback Park in the Boise foothills. With our support, this plant has just been temporarily, temporarily listed on the noxious weed list by ISDA. Uh, this plant is considered highly invasive and noxious in the southeastern, southeastern United States. And up to this point, the furthest western detection of this plant was in Texas. So we are very grateful for the support of citizens who help us identify and take action on invasive plants before they become a huge problem. In terms of cooperation, I would like to highlight some of the relationships that we've fostered with other public, ag public agencies to control noxious weeds. Every year we do between $15,000 and $20,000 of noxious weed survey and control work uh, through BLM grants. We help federal agencies perform invasive weed control studies and experiments. We control noxious weeds in the rights of way for ITD. We help with restoration efforts for Idaho Fish and Game properties and on the Boise River WMA. We work closely with directors Coburg and Batista to control noxious weeds in public spaces like the Green Belt and Lady Bird Park. Uh, we work with Solid Waste and the Sheriff's Office to clear the roadsides and infrastructure access areas. We also have improved our relationships with ACHD and the irrigation districts in efforts to control noxious weeds in public rights of way on canal easements and in areas where noxious weeds are spreading from private land onto the public domain. The West State of Fuel Station expense in revenue is included in the noxious weed control budget. We operate and service the fuel station to help provide fuel dispensing services to all Ada County departments and offices. The station generated around $143,000 in gross revenue in FY21, and we charge five cents on the gallon to maintain the island and infrastructure. Last year, I increased the fuel budget uh, by about 15%, and sadly, it was not close to being enough to keep the tanks full. As of Wednesday, we have overspent this line and had to transfer money from the noxious weed control budget into the fuel line so that we could cover and make sure that the tanks are full. You know, I probably don't have to explain why we exceeded projected expenses in this department or on this line, <laughs> uh, but I think it helps to add some perspective. When we look back at the average fuel prices from FY18 to FY21, and these are all of our purchase numbers, by the way, we purchased in bulk, um, one might be hard pressed to see where projected fuel costs would exceed $3 per gallon. But so far this year, our average purchase price has been $3.52 per gallon, which is a 28% increase from our FY21 uh, purchase price, and as of this moment, our purchase price is $4.88 per gallon. Uh, and because our purchase po purchasing power has been cut by 78%, we are requesting an ongoing supplemental for $50,000 to help mitigate the risks of fuel price instability. I hope that's going to be enough. <laughs> Last year, we had a CIP for purchasing and installing new backup generators for our facility. The project was initially budgeted at $300,000 and the board approved it for FY22. However, when the project went to bid, the lowest bidder came in at around $500,000. So we have asked operations to postpone the project until we can adequately budget for it. Uh, I'd like to shout out to Bob Perkins and all the procurement folks, Bruce Crisco, Josh Brown, and everyone who helped us with this. And sorry, we couldn't move forward on that. So. For FY23, we have three supplemental requests, the first being the fuel line supplemental I just spoke about. The second supplemental is ongoing for fleet vehicle uh, replacement. Our current fleet vehicles in noxious weed control age, a, range in age, excuse me, from seven to 15 years old, and many are in need of replacement. We would like to replace two vehicles per year, and that's why we we're asking for a supplemental in the amount of $100,000 for that. The last supplemental, supplemental request is to allow for heavy equipment contracting. 
This is to serve our overall mission of integrated pest management. That is utilizing several different methods of preventing and controlling noxious weed infestations. And we would like to have the flexibility to hire contractors to provide mechanical control options for infestations that would allow for greater control and also for sensitive areas where herbicides might not be the best choice. This is our overall budget submission. It's important to note that with the help of HR, we have included substantial market adjustments for all field positions. These increases have been included within the flat budget for personnel, which is respectfully submitted at $758,991. At this time, I would like to thank Director Cowley, Josh Nielsen, Jessica Donald, Andrea Byrne, and Taya Molino for their help with compensation analysis and for just being awesome overall. Um, our operating request is $521,707, bringing the total request to $1,280,698 with supplementals included. Uh, fund balance for this department is just over $1 million. Um, if it pleases the board and there are no questions about Knox Sweet Control, we'll move on to PEST. Okay, go ahead. Ada County Pest Abatement District is a special taxing district that includes all unincorporated areas of Ada County highlighted on the map in blue. The PAD, the PAD excuse me, is tasked with controlling pocket gopher and rock chuck infestations on private land within the 894 square mile district. I think it was suggested that um, earlier in the week that I bring maybe uh, one of these varmints in for a little show and tell, maybe caged up. Uh, I'm afraid they're not as fluffy or as pleasant as they look, and so this is as close as I'm going to get for that. <laughs> um, this slide shows on the left there are pocket gophers there, and then that's a pocket gopher mound right below that. And then the yellow-bellied marmot on the top right. Uh, followed uh, Down below you can see two marmots that have burrowed under uh, a homeowner's porch right there. And that's typically what they do. They like to get around um, facilities or homes or outbuildings, and they like to dig around and mess with the foundations or chew up the wires in your car. Um, they do all kinds of damage, and so that's why they're, we need to control these guys. The PAD's mission is to abate pocket gophers and yellow-bellied marmots that threaten agriculture or infrastructure while providing value and outstanding service to the district residents. The core values are shared between all of our departments. We follow the law. We take work orders from district residents, uh, control harmful rodent populations. We educate folks on how to manage pests for themselves. And we also work to stay current with the integrated pest management trends and help our folks stay licensed. Here's a short summary of the work we did in FY21. We completed over 2,000 work orders, including 2,200 inspections with 5,600 acres treated. The number of gophers we trapped are up 80% from FY20, and I think we can, can attribute that to the uh, impressive skill sets our, that our returning technicians have developed. Uh, the number of rock chuck work orders and out of district calls we are documenting is holding steady around 150 each. Uh, we saw notable decreases in the pro productivity, particularly in acres treated. I think it's also important to note that we were short staffed. Uh, we were staffed at around 60% for the entire uh, season last year in PEST. Uh, we were fortunate to have some of our more experienced technicians return. And I'm glad to say that we have had stable leadership at the division coordinator position, that's Chris Culley, who has helped us do more with less. We're all very proud of the extra hustle and commitment shown by our field technicians to get as much work done as they did. Our budget submission for the Pest Abatement District includes market adjustments for the field positions that are included within the flat personnel request. Our personnel request is $255,380. Operating expense is $509,892, bringing the total appropriation request or equal to the appropriation at 765,272. Uh, the fund balance for the district stands at $1.6 million.
The Ada County Mosquito Abatement District is also a special taxing district. We provide mosquito abatement services to all the folks who reside within the 400 square mile district. The district is essentially comprised of all the incorporated areas of Ada County highlighted on the map in orange. Uh, within the Mosquito Abatement District, there are three programs of service. Uh, the surveillance program traps and speciates mosquitoes and identifies hotspots of mosquito activity while testing for presence of disease. The larvicide program treats mosquito breeding sites throughout the district to prevent hatching of adult mosquitoes. The adulticide program abates adult mosquitoes either as a request for service or in response to a West Nile virus detection. The MAD's mission is to control mosquitoes that are both a nuisance and potential vector of disease to Ada County residents using, using the best available data and sound science practices through integrated mosquito management principles. We actively monitor and surveil mosquito populations throughout the district for high mosquito counts and for presence of disease. We also respond to requests for service from our district residents. And you'll see that we place a high priority on educating not only our district residents, but also those folks who reside with that outside the district or who follow us on social media. Mosquito abatement is a highly technical field and we work to keep our folks knowledgeable on the most advanced science that is available. And we often work with districts across the nation to share abatement methods, insecticide resistance data, fleet management, invasive species data, and other important operational knowledge so that we can all be better at what we do. As you know, commissioners, last year was the worst year we've ever experienced in terms of West Nile prevalence. Uh, here are some numbers that might help tell the story. Uh, we set 165 traps throughout the abatement district. And in FY21, we trapped over 44,000 mosquitoes. That's up over 90% from FY20. We tested over 25,000 mosquitoes for presence of disease and had 107 of those test pools come back positive for West Nile virus. That beats our previous record of 90 de detections set back in 2013. And so not only did we see a lot more virus within the mosquito populations, we noted that more of the trapped mosquito populations were West Nile virus uh, vector species. That's Culex tarsalis and Culex pipiens, making up an average of 57% of all trapped mosquitoes, where we normally might see that number average around 40%. Idaho Health and Welfare reports that there were 11 confirmed cases of West Nile virus in humans last year, including five cases that were neuroinvasive, causing encephalitis, meningitis, or West Nile poliomyelitis. Sadly, I must report that two people in the Ada County died from the West Nile last year, both residing within the, uh, the Mosquito Abatement District boundaries. The heat map on this slide illustrates the surveillance sites that reported West Nile last year. Traditionally, we would see the sites that followed the Boise River and its drainage to report the highest disease presence. But last year, we saw neighborhoods in Boise and Meridian and Star and agricultural areas in CUNA, they were testing hot all year. Um, so this confirms or at least uh, supports the theory that a hot, dry summer and overwatering in artificial sites, uh, lawns and agricultural areas, uh, produced more Culex genus mosquitoes, along with an earlier and more consistent presence of disease within those populations. Our larvicide operations are focused on finding sites throughout the district that could harbor mosquito development and treating them with the naturally occurring bacteria to kill the larvae. We are currently monitoring over 48,000 active development sites and we, are, we have identified over 3,700 new sites in FY21. We completed over 99,000 inspections and over 61,000 treatments where larvae had been detected. We responded to over 400 public service requests and treated over 900 acres in total. Notably, we had decrease in, decreases in productivity values for inspections and treatments completed, which is because, like PEST, we were working with about half of our normal or budgeted staff levels for all of our seasonal field technicians. Having said that, we increased the number of new sites mapped and active sites monitors and had, and monitored and had very little change in ground acres treated. And because we were short staff, we, lacked, we asked a lot of our full-time folks last year and they all stepped up to the plate. 
They worked a ton of overtime. They also worked across all three programs, gaining new skill sets and operational knowledge throughout the process. We are very proud of how hard they worked for us. The final component of our MAD, MAD operations is our adulticide program. If through our surveillance efforts, we identify an area where there are high mosquito counts or perhaps high counts of Hulex genus mosquitoes, we dispatch adulticide trucks to the area after dust to apply ultra low volume insecticides that provide a quick knockdown effect to those mosquito populations. We also perform this service at the request of our district residents or as a result of a West Nile detection. In that case, we will treat an area around one square mile around the trap that has produced the positive detection. In FY21, we completed over 1,700 fogging requests from district residents and created over 900 internal service requests for areas where adults were found in abundance. In total, we treated over 71,000 ground acres to control adult flying mosquitoes. Due to the high pressure of mosquitoes throughout the season, we had to do more fogging than we usually would. Although our public request did not increase much, we created a lot more service requests due to the high West Nile prevalence and high numbers of Culex mosquitoes being trapped throughout the district. You can see by the heat map on the side that we received a request for adult side services from all corners of the abatement district. I wanted to talk briefly about the aerial application that we completed last summer. As I reported, we had record high disease presence within the mosquito populations and we were una unable to control the outbreak with our ground-based services. We had initially scheduled the application, but because of community, uh, some community concerns, we delayed the event until city leaders could be consulted. Uh, the blue boxes were the proposed, proposed treatment blocks and the treatment was completed on the night of August 25th. I also wanted to talk about why we do aerial, app aerial applications. In this slide, each one of the x-axis columns represents a trap that was placed within the aerial treatment block uh, for a total of 32 trap sites. The dark blue line represents the count of Culex mosquitoes traps, trapped prior to the aerial for each site, and the light blue line represents the number of Culex mosquitoes trapped after the aerial application. We see that 27 of the sites saw a drastic decrease in the number of Culex mosquitoes post-application, and in some, in some cases down from 79 or 64, mosquitoes down to zero or one, uh, while two sites had no change and two sites saw an increase. Uh, we can attribute the no, train, no change in increased sites to being on the edge of the treatment blocks. We chose to do aerial applications when we must break this breeding cycle and disrupt exponential mosquito population in increases, and they're very effective at doing just that. And also, as you're aware, we had a couple of our social media posts about the treatment go viral, and we received some pushback from members of the community who were opposed to the aerial application. Because we are always working to increase our levels of service and community engagement, I had our program and education specialist do a deep dive on the analytics of the social media posts, and here are a few things that we learned. Uh, we were interviewed five times on local media sources to provide information on the aerial. One of our Facebook posts went viral, reaching 195,000 unique, 195, unique accounts. We had 3,639 individual reactions to our posts. Those are the like, the heart, the angry, or the sad face. <coughs> and of all of those reactions, only 588 were angry or sad face, which corresponds to being about 16% of all reactions. Over 5,000 comments were made on our posts, and 708 of them were considered to be negative. That's either opposed to the aerial, opposed to pesticides, or opposed to our operations in general. And more than 4,100 of the comments were positive or neutral in demeanor. When we looked at all the negative comments, we found that they had originated from only 159 unique accounts. Many of the comment commenters made a point to comment on all of our social media posts, and many of the, many of the comments were cut and paste type entries. It's too difficult or nearly impossible to determine whether all 159 commenters live in Ada County or within the district uh, or within the treatment blocks. I'm happy to report that we learned a lot from this experience and although it is impossible to please everyone, we have found new and more effective ways of engaging community leaders and increasing transparency. 
On to our budget request. <clears throat> we are requesting a field technician that will primarily work in the lab counting and identifying and testing mosquitoes for disease and helping with fleet equipment, maintenance, and repair in the off season. That position comes in loaded around $55,000. That position and market adjustment for all market adjustments for all field positions is included within the flat personnel budget where the overall request is $563,815. Our operating request is $913,522. And we have one supplemental request for an aerial application contingency at 100,000 bringing the total request to $1,477,337. The fund balance for the MAD uh, stands at $2.1 million. We respectfully request that the board approve the use of the 3% in the new construction role for both the pest and mosquito abatement districts. On Monday morning, we heard from Director Stephen O'Mara he spoke about our Alamo project, and it stands for Abatement, Logistics, and Mapping Operations. Um, and you will remember it, Commissioner Davidson. Uh, thank you. He is, of course, very humble about the accomplishments of his amazing team. I wanted to bring some perspective from our point of view on what this program is and what it'll do for us. Director O'Mara did correctly say that there's nothing like it in the abatement software world, which is true. It is state of the art and will only get better as time goes on. The biggest distinction that I would like to make is that this is not just one single program. The Alamo project includes GIS-based client maintenance and the mobile data collection platforms that feed into it. So Alamo serves as a central hub of information and there are several programming components such as pest mobile, weed mobile compliance, noxious weed free forage, mapping, customer portal, all that support the primary structure. There are several programs that Alamo interacts with including our fuel master systems for fuel and bulk pesticide dispensing, an inventory management system, which is also built by IT to help us track our inventory in real time. And that's no easy feat. This slide will hopefully clarify what I'm trying to communicate. Say we have created a work order in Alamo and we have assigned it to a noxious weed control field technician. Weed Mobile will display all of the work order information and record inspection data. That information will also be sent to the computers located in the field service field vehicles so that when the applicator goes to complete the work, all of the application data will be migrated from the field computer to Weed Mobile, um, which will then sync to Alamo for review, approval, and billing. So instead of having five or six disparate or separate systems uh, collecting information that needs to be pieced together, uh, to create bills and application records, we have a cohesive, a cohesive system where all programs work hand in hand to compile and record information in one place. In terms of costs, I wanted to add also some perspective to the $1.1 million price tag that Director O'Mara spoke about. Let's say that we should extrapolate that cost going forward and that each department's software components would cost around $550,000 to build and deploy. Our current legacy program is called Greenweed and Pest and it's been our software since 2002. And it is end of life. It will no longer be supported here soon. So if end of life comes this year, it would be a 20 year program. If Alamo lasts 20 years and we broke down the $550,000 cost for each department and paid that out as yearly increments, uh, we would pay around $27,500 uh, per department for programming. And I'll just say for comparison, the traditional route for most abatement districts or weed control departments is to hire one or two GIS analysts to handle integrations and to try to put all this information into spatial formats. If we were to hire two GIS analysts to work for us full time, they couldn't do what Alamo and all the components do. It's just impossible. We would still be in the same boat as far as compiling information from several disparate sources or programs and trying to patch it together to resemble something that would pass for a proper application record or in it as an invoice to a customer. So two GIS analysts would cost a minimum of $140,000 per year. That's an unloaded rate. So over 20 years, that, cost would, uh, that would cost county taxpayers a minimum of $2.8 million. So from my perspective, I would gladly pay less than I pay for one field technician to gain the function, uh, functionality, stability, ease of use, and for a program that helps us with training and saves us time in a ratio of about three to one when it comes to recording information in the field 
and running the processes all the way through to invoice, lien, and application record storage. So I would like to thank the fine folks again in, in IT and GIS who are involved with this project. That's Director Romero, Todd Buchanan, Deborah Fulkerson, Emily Weiss, Matthew Lee, Tom Lightfoot, Dr. Amy Herrig, Rich Eveland, Aaron Kahn, but most of our infinitely talented development team, that's Colt Wright, Scott Thomas, Wesley Stevens, and a guy uh, who has devoted oh, the last four years of his life to this project and has proven to be a one-of-a-kind employee for Ada County, that's Kenneth Hatkey. So thank you all. Education is the single most important factor when, in preventing weed and pest and mosquito populations from causing harm. The more folks we can educate about how to identify problem weeds, where to find mosquito development sites, and what gopher holes look like, the more folks, folks can feel empowered to help mitigate these pests on their own or neighboring properties. We work hard uh, to engage the public, including our own trade associations. We give tours, we educate classes, we show up to events with our education trailer, we give out goat head balloons to kids, you can see on the, on the right there, um, and we post how-to videos on our YouTube page and update the community with our website and social media pages. Not to mention hanging out every year at the Western Idaho Fair, eating prano pups with our good friend, Mr. Bob Batista, who you'll hear from next. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, I'm happy to stand for any questions or comments about our budget submission or the services we provide. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate your, uh, your report. Uh, is there any questions from the commission? I know Ryan has some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how are you doing with uh, employee hiring, retention for the, the summer positions, the part-time? How's the wages impacting uh, recruitment efforts? Could you give us an update on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Davidson, so a couple of different answers to that question. Um, as far as our field full-time uh, folks, uh, full-time benefited folks, we're having absolutely some serious troubles this year, especially in noxious weed control where we have two of six field positions working right now. That's uh, three vacancies. We just made an offer on one position um, and then one uh, position who's also kind of uh, been out for family issues. Um, so uh, as far as in full-time for our noxious weed control, we're, we're in pretty big trouble this year. Uh, having said that, moving to the seasonal uh, uh, labor pool, we have increased the wages that we're offering for all of our seasonal labor applicants. Um, unfortunately, they're getting paid in some cases more than our full-time folks in order to just get folks in the building and, and make sure that we can perform the services that we need to, particularly in mosquito abatement. And so um, we are seeing better numbers as far as um, um, staffing goes in mosquito abatement. Um, probably have about three or four positions that are still open, however. Pest abatement staying steady around 70% uh, uh, capacity at, at staffing needs right now. What's your uh, lowest starting wage currently? Uh, we just offered um, a candidate, excuse me, um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson, we just offered a candidate at 1407 for an hourly wage, um, which is which will, if the board chooses to approve this, um, this budget, uh, those, dra uh, those wages will increase uh, drastically. We'll move from about that 1407 starting wage to about $17. And that's included within the flat personnel request for all three. Do, do the seasonal employees get benefits? I can't remember. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson, no, they do not. Well, I, I have to say they might get benefits through their temporary agency but not through us and then on the uh heavy uh equipment uh contractor additional requests could you kind of talk about that a little bit what what exactly what functions they would be doing mr chairman commissioner davidson so basically what we'd like to do is be able to hire some contract mowers or diskers or or custom uh, tractor work so that if we have large scale infestations where noxious weed control infestations can be controlled mechanically, we'd like to do a little bit more of that as opposed to spraying over sites where maybe they're not welcome or maybe they're not a good choice. Will that be on public and private land or? Commission Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson, yes, sir. 
So for private land, do you have to get permission of the landowner or do, or do we have to give them notice that they're required to do it and then we would do it with the contractors if they can't? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson, yes, that's all part of our noxious weed uh, compliance uh, program. If we do locate a noxious weed infestation and um, we find that the uh, landowner is not compliant, we'll send them a letter saying you have five days to contact us. Um, if they do not contact us, then we'll plan for control of those noxious weed infestations and we will bill the landowner what it costs to abate those uh, infestations. If they don't pay, then we lien their property. So that's all part of the Idaho noxious weed law. So that's why we're the enforcement agents. Have you run into a lot of cases where this would have come in handy? A few, yes, sir, um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Davidson. Yes, we find we'd like to have the flexibility at least to offer some of those where the noxious, where it makes sense. I would say, you know, we can't always um, offer those because sometimes when we're talking about particularly infestations like white top, um, that's a rhizomatous plant. So if you disc it or mow it, it just gets worse the next year. But if you're talking about large scale infestations of maybe biennial, uh, plants like scotch thistle or um, or some of the other ones, then you, perhaps a disking or a mowing would, would control those for the current growing season, and then we could talk about uh, control efforts for the next. All right. Well, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate uh, all the good work you're doing for the county and keeping us mosquito-free. I know that's uh, definitely a, a big quality of life issue, especially if you come from a place that has a lot of mosquitoes. It's, you know, really noticeable difference. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Are there any other questions from yeah, the board? Yeah, Mr. Chair, yes, I just ahead. wanted to you know, talk a little bit about um, the spraying, the, the West Nile. I think um, you know this department is kind of the one of the more quiet departments until it's not. And actually having two deaths um, from West Nile is just devastating to the families. And so I think you know that we could do a much better job um, maybe with PSAs and social media, maybe we could get together with Elizabeth and figure out if people understand that overwatering is a big part of this problem that would also help, help with the drought conditions that we're experiencing. But I don't think people put two and two together. It's not just um, that they show up randomly. There's things that people can do to help prevent this and just raise the awareness in, in what products you can use um, because I just don't think too deaths are acceptable for our county. I think we can we can do a better job communicating. So I think the whole board would be behind you and putting together, like I said, some PSAs, um, especially the right timing, you know, um, during the year or so in social media. Um, and then I just wanted to go to weed and ask on the fuel increases, the fleet replacement, if those are used um, throughout weed pest and mosquito, why are those um, costs just going into to weed? Um, Mr. Chairman, Madam Commissioner, do you mean the fuel price? Like the fuel increase? Wouldn't the fuel increase be across on all three? So why is that just um, in your weed budget? Mr. Chairman, Madam Commissioner, the so the funding source or the mechanism for paying for fuel and dispensing the services is included in the noxious weed control budget. So um, all of our departments and all Ada County departments pay for the fuel that we dispense. However, just for the funding mechanism, um, where we put that money, where Kathleen puts that money so that we can buy fuel, um, happens to be in a separate uh, section of noxious weed control line. Okay, that's how, okay. And then they bill back like pest and mosquito pay the weed for the fuel that they use, but that's just to purchase the mess fuel. Okay, got it, okay. That makes sense now. Okay, thanks. I just want to say thank you for all your work. You guys do a great job, and hopefully we can get those wages up where they're a livable wage and you can get some folks in the door helping. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Commissioner Kenyon. Thank you, Commissioner Davidson. I appreciate your time, and uh, have a great rest of the day. And yeah, weekend. thank oh, happy you. Happy Father's Day, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Is that it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, we need to do some messaging about that. Two deaths is not acceptable. Right. Moving on, Bob Batista has been the director for Expo Idaho for 22 years. 
Expo Idaho is an enterprise fund and receives no tax support and consists of two departments, fair and interim events. Expo Idaho is located on the northwest corner of Shinden and Glenwood. The campus footprint consists of 240 acres that encompasses 80,000 square feet, or 80,000 square foot expo building and several smaller buildings and barns. There's a grandstand seating for 4,000 people, 4,500 spaces for vehicles to park, and a 225 slip RV park next to the Boise River. This year marks the 125th anniversary of the Western Idaho Fair, which starts the third Friday in August of each year. The Western Idaho Fair promotes the Treasure Valley's heritage to agriculture, takes pride in being a role model for our community's education, and celebrates all that Ada County has to offer. This all takes place in 10 days with attendance of approximately 275,000 people, making it Idaho's largest event. Interim events are activities or shows and gatherings that occur the remainder of the year when the Western Idaho Fair is not in progress. There are approximately 150 event interim events each year, equating to 260 event days per year. Some of the events include the Sportsman Show, Roadster Show, Flea Market, Ski Swap, Home and Garden Show, Health Fair, Dog and Cat Shows, Weddings, the Boise Music Fest, and every five years, High Aldi. Expo Idaho is a self-supported fund, budget submitted for FY23, $7,898,400, $1,251,000 above their uh, adopted budget for the prior year. This is covered with increased revenue. Their budget to actual over the course from 18 to 23 and the number of employees. I'd like to introduce Bob Batista, who will talk about Expo's budget. Thank you. So how do we change the slides, Kathleen, so I know? Well, I think it's not that. Um, I don't know. I'm not an expert. There you go. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Bob. Welcome to, welcome to the, our chambers. Just blink twice, and they'll move. Yeah. Well, um, this is my 23rd budget presentation. Um, my first one was down in the basement of the Boise City offices. As some of you may or may not remember, the commissioners were Grant Kingsford and Roger Simmons and Frank Walker. Um, so we've come a long ways in where we were and where we're going. Uh, for 22 years, I've been the director of Expo Idaho and the Western Night Affair, and we have successfully managed to be in the black every year. As always, we are building a budget in night for 23 here, um, which we haven't even gone through the 2022 fair. So we're always a year behind when we do this budget um, for you every year. The provo the pro proposed budget was unanimously approved by the Expo Idaho Advisory Board during the April uh, meeting that we had. I'd like to thank my staff uh, for enduring these last couple of years, which have been challenging as it has been for most all of the other departments. I'd also like to thank a lot of the other departments that will interact with me and help me get through um, some of the times that have been really tough this past year, and the commissioners, uh, your support as well. I'd also like to give a shout out to Kathleen Graves. She's always been very helpful with me. We are a little bit different department than the regular county departments. Uh, we kind of operate under a different philosophy, and we're we're. A, a department that provides more entertainment than generally county services. Uh, here's a slide that talks a little bit about heritage. We've been in this business for, like I said, 125 years coming up. Expo Idaho is a valued community property that serves the citizens of Ada County in times of prosperity and despair. We come together and to share these commonalities and carry a message of community as we move forward. The cultural heritage here at Expo Idaho since its opening in 1967 is what sets us apart from uh, what sets us apart and we cannot lose sight of the impact this asset is on our community. And again, I will refer to that this year is our 125th anniversary. That's currently what we look like today. 
a beautiful piece of property that the citizens of Aida County through surveys have uh, expressed that they enjoy and appreciate and like it to stay. That's what we looked like in 1967. As you can see, we were the first ones in that area. They built up around us. And so we have challenges with being the first one there and as the community developed around us. Got to keep with my slides so I can keep the notes. Huh? Is that Chinden or which one's um, Chinden? would be very down in this right. corner here. Um, you can see that even plantation and all those places along the river were not even developed at the time. Our mission, Expo Idaho is a self-sustaining, multi-purpose year-round venue that hosts events fostering community, business, agriculture, and entertainment in the Treasure Valley. The Western Idaho Fair, uh, we bring citizens of Ada County and the Treasure Valley together through Idaho Community Agricultural Education, competitions for youth and adult development, entertainment, demonstrations, and participated, participation in Idaho's largest event. Our core values are community oriented, quality service, product integrity, competent staff, and fiscal responsibility. Our long-term goals for Expo Idaho to be a self-sustaining facility. We host a minimum of 150 events per year utilizing a variety of facilities and grounds amenities. We have a 90% minimum occupancy annually at the Boise River, Riverside RV Park. And we provide the Ada County citizens with the quality operations that supports a year-round multi-purpose facility. Long range goals for the Western Air Fair, Fair, excuse me, is to be a self-sustaining event that have a minimum of 3,000 competitors and 15,000 exhibitors each year at the fair. We provide agricultural education to the greater community, uh, the greater Treasure Valley community. You'll see I have a lot of time, a lot of words in here about community. We are very community, community, community based oriented. We have an annual attendance of, uh, of 275,000 people, which makes us the largest event in the state. We provide community programs to our youth and adult and to our youth and adult development. Excuse me, I'm having a hard time saying that. We ensure that the citizens of Ada County are given the opportunity to celebrate their community each year at the end of the year as the end of summer event. Our matrix for success are to secure long-term and repeat customers, increase facility use for those events that happen only once. Those examples are weddings, quinceaneras, and family gatherings. We continue to maintain our Arvari Park facility at a 90% occupancy. We look to maintain and grow the Western Idaho Fair attendance by 3% each year. We look to increase the 1.2 million footfalls that attend, use, participate, or walk through the Expo Idaho grounds each year. We continue to pursue market value pay for all our employees as we deal with a shortage of labor, goods, and supply chain issues. This is an, uh, an issue that you folks have heard pretty consistently through all of our other departments. Accomplishments for 21-22, Expo Idaho is a self-supporting enterprise fund. Our revenues are used to operate the facilities, reinvest in improvements and maintenance of Expo Idaho. As an enterprise fund, we always encourage staff to find efficient and effective ways of maintaining Expo Idaho and surrounding, amen and surrounding amenities while keeping costs down and increasing our revenues. I want to thank the Board of 80 County Commissioners for the ARPA funds they were granted to move forward with the replacement of the Expo building roof, the turf club roof, the removals of the stables that were once part of the horse racing, um, uh, horse racing, whatever, <laughs> okay. Uh, able to put together Idaho's largest event in 2021 with COVID-19 still prevalent. This was an event that the community needed and it proved to be our largest fair attended in the 124 year history. Some accomplishments 
that we are kind of proud of. We helped out with virtually little or no cost to United Way. A lot of people don't know that there's a lot of homeless students that do not have uh, some of the amenities they need for basic life, so they put the other baskets for them at, the, at uh, Expo Idaho. We continue to help with the food bank, the Thanksgiving baskets, we had Christmas in color. We stored some UPS trailers. We have a continuing group of folks that want to go bird watching in the racetrack. We've been launching hot air balloons. We've added the summer concert series. We're proud of being able to have a successful fair in 21. We just got through doing a national pinners conference. Um, youth sports are increasing on the grounds. We've continued to supply scholarships to our community and we've upped the, the amount of money that we have been giving those folks. We also do free rental training. Um, we interact with a lot of departments and the training that we give for those free places as Adam just alluded to, they come down there and they calibrate all their sprayers out there so they can spray the weeds. Paramedics come down there and do EVOC training. Ada County Sheriff's Office participates in a lot of free training out at the fairgrounds. We also work with uh, Park and Rec's department. Part of the green belt out on the fairgrounds is the Parks and Rec's department, but should Scott need any help out there and send his people clear from the other side of town, we pick up that, that help that we need. We feel it's very important as a department to be interacting with other departments and work as a whole to provide better services for the citizens of Ada County. Our budget, um, on the revenue side, as you can see in actual 2021, our overall revenues exceeded this year's budget. Our fair revenues exceeded this coming year's budget. So in looking at the 2023 budget and the inflation with the potential direction of maybe some recession, and that we've never been, we've never been, we haven't been through the 2022 fair. It's a little bit of a shot in the dark to try and figure out where we're going to go. We still believe that our facilities are, which are being heavily utilized right now, um, are something that's gonna continue as the, uh, the growth continues in this valley. The expenses for, um, 2021, um, on the personnel side, uh, that has increased this year, primarily because we've bumped up the sheriff's um, revenue for them in the A budget. The operating budget is increased, and that's just primarily due to the cost of increased in goods, services, and the supply chain shortage. Our capital this year, I will go into the next slide, but we have some things that we feel we need to improve for not only the patrons, but the renters that use the facility. Mr. Chair. Yes. So Bob, did you say you increased what you pay to the sheriffs? Yes, we did. Okay, by how much? Um, I'll go into the next slide and I'll show that with you. Because I know there is some contention here. Right, <laughs> well, just where does it go, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I'll show you where, I, where my head's at and what I think the sheriff has missed, uh, not completely been, been, uh, been informed of all that happens out there. Our personnel budget um, is 924,000. That includes a $20,000 increase to the sheriff, which now puts it at $85,000 a year. We pay that, that comes out of the A budget per Kathleen in the sheriff's office. Our operating budget is up again. Um, that's primarily due to expenses and our capital is up. And then I'll go into some of those um, different things. I'd like to address the sheriffs um, wanting to have $93,000 put in his budget. For the long, this is my fourth sheriff, by the way. Uh, we've had a long-standing gentleman's agreement with Sheriff Von Colleen, Gary Rainey, and at least the first part of Sheriff Bartlett's term here, where WIF would pay the regular wages of the deputies. Um, and that the overtime would be picked up by the sheriffs, the sheriffs and uh, the sheriff's department. The sheriffs and I have had agreement that um, 
The sheriff should be out there protecting our assets. The sheriff should be providing security for the personnel. They were out there to do public relations, out to do goodwill, and out to recruit people and just have a basic presence. And up until recently, we've agreed to that. Um, the sheriff's office, in their request for an additional increase, um, I have to let you know that in 2021, as I stated back in that training video that we gave them, the sheriff's office, if we were to charge them rack rate like they're charging us full rate for our sheriffs out there, um, in 2021, they used $56,250 worth of rental out there to do their training for various departments. They also receive a free booth at the fair for recruiting their people, and they are deeply discounted for their rent as a substation. My calculations equal $88,250. We paid $65,000 last year in security, which we've always had uh, an agreement that we would pay at minimum of half of that amount of the bill that is sent to us. So what that equates to is $153,000 uh, and $153,250. The bill we received from the sheriff's office last year was for $124,324. The sheriff, based on my calculations, received an extra $28,926 in services from Expo Idaho. Um, as it stands today, the sheriff's budget is $101,980,000. If we were to increase this because of the $20,000 we have added to this, this is 701 tenths of 1% of their budget. I don't believe this impacts. This is kind of like David and Goliath to me. Uh, I have a hard time with that because we do give them value back. I don't think Miss um, Bolacek understands from her desk that we give them quite a bit more other than just the dollar value. A couple other things that I'd like to note. Um, the sheriff said that the fairgrounds and Butler Amusement said that this was one of the safest fairs they play. It is. But it isn't because of the sheriffs. It's because of the management. It's because of the culture. It's because of the environment we live in. We are far more safer than Sacramento. We are far more safer than Grass Valley. We are far more safer than Vancouver, Washington, where they play. It's just the culture. Blackfoot says the same thing. The sheriff's office also said that um, they've made several attempts to communicate with me to try and get this. That's a falsehood. I have not met with the current Sheriff Clifford to talk about this. Um, and so um, I feel that that is something that we should have a conversation about. I will leave that topic alone. I didn't want to have this be part of the discussion, but it was brought up in there. As Commissioner Kenyon said, we should not be having a um, tax funded department be funding a enterprise fund. I also feel that's the reverse case as well. An enterprise fund should not be funding a tax support system. And at the current rate, we are doing so. Okay, we'll pass that on now. At least I think my point has been made. The improvements uh, requested Expo Idaho, we need to improve Expo Idaho on the grounds to provide a safe place for the public and the events that are being held. Our renters want to see improvements to the building so that they know Expo Idaho is continuing to improve both the renter and the public experience. Updates to Expo Idaho, this is where I would like to use some of that money that I uh, previously showed you in the uh, capital improvements. I believe it's time that we need to replace all the existing lights in the building 
Expo building with more efficient LED lights. The interior of the Expo building needs to be painted. We are looking to replace all the lights out in the parking lot with new LEDs. Those sodiums are, are, are lights that do not give you a clear picture of what you're doing in the parking lots. And I've set some money aside to possibly replace or remodel some of the stuff in the turf club because we haven't concluded what that situation is with the RFI. Um, I want again, sincerely thank the commissioners for the ARPA funds for the demolition of the horse stalls, replacement of the expo building, the turf club, and also now as we work into the Expo Idaho Park development. I stand for questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate your your uh, your presentation. Uh, are there questions from the commissioners? Sure, um, Bob. Go, what's go your ahead. what's your current fund balance? Uh, I don't know. That's the, off the top of my head, but I believe it's uh, in excess of four million. And then I would encourage you and the sheriff to get together. This is not the place for us to try to figure those things out. That needs to be. And, and, and I the respect sheriff. that, but I, I, when my department is being brought up in a in a uh, budget hearing, I will defend it. I understand that. I'm just instructing nope, you to I, go talk I, to I, the sheriff. I understand that. And then let us know where this goes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. By Monday if, or Tuesday, if possible. Well, Monday's a holiday, and I have it. I'll see if I can get in connection with the sheriff. Okay, so we can know whether to take that yeah, out of his. Sure, be happy okay, to do that. Thank you. I think one other question that, that Commissioner Davison raised: Could we do this with more private security? I don't believe so. If the sheriff were to schedule a certain amount of people down there, and there was this situations that would require more than the ones that were on there right now, I think the the relationship is adequate, and serves its purpose but I think we would be pulling people off of their duties to come down there to serve some of the situations that would be taking place at the fairgrounds. And I think that would be more strain on the, on the sheriff's office than having the original amount of group here. The other situation we're facing here right now is that um, we're struggling with our current contracted uh, security company to even fill right now, possibly the people for the music festival and I'm greatly concerned about coming up with fair time as we deal with this shortage. Thank you for clarifying that. That's you know, you're welcome. And I think you make some pretty relevant points about the cost between the, the sheriffs and the and the fairgrounds and the additional services. It's we have been, we have worked really well with the departments. Um, I believe this is something that um, we will work out. At the request of Mr. And Mrs. Uh, Commissioner Kenyon, we will work on that first thing come Tuesday morning when we're back in the office. Uh, any other questions, Commissioner? Um, how's the uh, em employee retention, wages? How's the, the seasonal recruitment going? Um, it's slow. It's difficult. Um, I have started turning business away. We don't have the staff. The staff that is working there is working overtime. Um, the, the, the positions we don't have filled, we're pulling out from uh, a staffing department and what we're paying them on top of the fee is exceeding what our people are getting paid. Um, we're being sympathetic to what this world and what you folks are going through. We are not asking for any in new employees. We're gonna try and continue to make it work with what we have, but we are down and it is becoming as everybody gets out of the pandemic, wants to do events, wants to interact with people, wants to be social, and we're accommodating it as best we can. Um, I can tell you right now, our interim event reached a million dollars uh, this month. That's a, a whole month ahead of last year. We are currently $536,000 ahead of last year on our interim side, and we haven't even gotten into June, and last year we didn't even have the music festival because of pandemic. So um, we're doing quite well um, in our department, but we are facing challenges that are very similar to the rest of the departments. What's gonna be the, uh, the summer wage for the seasonal fair workers this year? We're working with our temp agency right now. We're seeing some that we gave raises last year to, to try and get through this. Um, they're asking for more again. As a 10 day fair, we have uh, 
some loyalty and some people that come back because the fair is, is an operation that they thoroughly enjoy. But they're also in the mix of the world and saying, I really do like being out here, but um, I certainly could use a couple extra dollars per hour. So we're working through that. And have you gotten with uh, HR to you know reevaluate wages or salaries or? We have not. A lot of a lot of where our staff is is the maintenance area there, and I know Bethany and there's a lot of other departments that have virtually the same types of people. Um, but it's hard sometimes to be lumped into a county department when we run like our own business. We make our own money. We do all of our own things, and so. It can be frustrating for my staff to sit there and be put into a tax supported system versus a non one when we feel like we, if we ran our own business and wasn't and we weren't tied to the government, we'd have a little bit more flexibility to do things. All right. Well, I definitely appreciate your uh, presentation and of course looking for forward to uh, another successful fair this year. I believe we're going to have a gangbusters. I think this gas prices that are um, right where they're at right now is going to deter some people from traveling out of town. And it's the last event of the year, the last event before school starts. And our product is a very good product and people like it. It's been proven. So um, we're anticipating another large year. Mr. Chair. Yes. So just a couple of clarification, clarifications. Um, do you have anything in here for your rebranding efforts? Uh, no, but our marketing department feels that we can Close loop cover can do that, that under, yep, within mm -hmm. their existing yep, contract. Yep, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, and then the uh, turf club remodel is that in there? Two hundred and about two hundred and seventy-five thousand. I'd have to go back and look on it, but there it's it, le it exceeds uh, a quarter of a million dollars. Yes. Okay, and that's not the roof. Is that remodel on the inside, or that would be? Should we not be able to get the simulcast that uh, we've been pushing for for a while? If that doesn't happen, you can see the request from the uh, interest that was out there. There was nobody else, so we feel we're going to have to go in there and do something to make that facility be able to be rented to the tune of about two hundred seventy-five thousand. But you don't have a design or anything. No, but we have some professional services money that we would bring in somebody to help us do that. Well, this to me is kind of like the landfill that we, we ended up in our budget books. Um, the whole build out without us even seeing any, you know, having discussions about what that would look like. So I would just as soon um, see you put in a maybe a design fee in here to begin with instead of a trying to guesstimate what a remodel would look no, like. What I was that. saying is in professional service, our line items, we have 100,000 on the interim side and 100,000, which we would go out and be able to use that money to get a design service to help us do that. I guess I'm still unclear than where you're getting the 275,000. That's coming from our operating money from the money we're going to make from the fair. Right, I get that, but. <laughs> So it sounds to me like, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but you've got 200,000 in, in professional services for the design mm -hmm. and 275,000 within a capital line for whatever the design may play out to be. That's correct. And we don't, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and we don't know what that looks like. Paul's talking about yeah. the same thing. It just was different what ways of even, saying it. What, what that would even look like. What are we doing a remodel for? What type of business purpose? I would just assume we have more discussion around that. That's um, certainly something we can do. I think we need to figure out whether or not we're going to have a tenant yeah, potentially. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, commissioners, I think yes. it goes back to the point that if it's not budgeted, we can't right. do anything we, with it. So yeah, it has right. to be, we've had this conversation. So Right. I just want so, to make sure that, you know, we're not just approving right. that by putting it in here. We need to continue to have conversations. And then was on the consulting, you had 100000 in here for... Consultants, that's not the design, right? That's something else? Well, we're in a lot of flux right now, and I put some money in there anticipating that there may be some need for them some, for some of that from my department as we go forward with moving Ladybird Park and the park, uh, the big park thing, development. You may want to put some money on me to try and figure out ways to help that. I don't know where all your head's at or where all the budget money is coming from, but I'm trying to be a team player and make sure that we can have something if you need to fall back on something. So
So that's what that is, the consultant that's contingency. That's correct. Yep. Okay. okay. Yep. That helps. Okay. We just have one line in here with the numbers. We don't have what it's for. So that's, They're good questions, and I hope that I answered them for you, whether we, the, the confusion was just based on how we say it. Thanks. Thank Good you job. very much. Yeah. I appreciate it's a lot all of you. better shape than we were in three years ago, yeah. isn't it? Pardon me? <laughs> so we're a lot better shaped than three oh. years ago when we were under the $1 yeah. million yeah. Dollar mark. On this, that was, this was a challenge. The, the hospitality industry got hit probably the hardest of any of them with the pandemic. Sure I think we did a pretty good job of working our way out of it and being creative on how to find revenues and at the same time support other departments that needed the open space and needed places to conduct meetings and training and so forth. So yes, we are always about trying to help other departments and make this the, the community a better place through our that. business. Absolutely. And, 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 and uh, I think uh, I want to congratulate you for the, for the effort you put in last year because you went a whole year without doing a fair because of the pandemic. And uh, I think the success of the, of, of the 2021 fair was sort of the beginning of the end of this, of this pandemic. We were still in the middle of, a, of people getting, getting the COVID and so forth, but I think people were exhausted. And the fair was, I think, a, a, an indication that we're getting back to normal. And I think that was a great thing that, uh, that we were able to provide to the citizens of this community. And your, your participation was, was uh, to put on that kind of a fair because it was great, both in the advanced ticket sales and the amusements and everything. It was, I think it was a great thing to do. Incidentally, uh, I appreciate your efforts. We're, we, we finally, the first time, this board actually passed a resolution to, to move Lady Bird Park. <laughs> we're in that process of getting that done thanks to your efforts and your 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 board and so forth and uh, so i appreciate uh, everything you've done for the community thank you mr chairman i, I want to thank you all for the support you've given us um without your support um the the 21 fair probably would have not probably been quite as, as uh, fruitful and and financially advantageous for us um, you saw that the community really needed that injection in their arm to try and pardon the pun. It wasn't the vaccine, but it was the injection of the <laughs> ability to go out there and be around other human beings and interact and, and share things. It was I think it was really important for everybody, including the staff, to kind of get our feet back in the game and go forward. So a sense yeah. of normalcy brought back to the community. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. again, I, I thank you all for your support. I thank you for your support for the ARPA money. It puts us in a good place going forward. And if this park department, this uh, Expo Park development, at the end of the day, if there's some added money that needs to be used based on how this all plays out, we are looking to be part of that. We want to see this developed and be more so than just what we have right now as we look at that uh, theoretical 88 acres that's been sitting vacant for, for six years. Yes. Thank you again for your presentation and thanks for your service to the community. Yeah, just one more thing, Mr. Chair. Oh, I think sorry. this board um, can give a shout out to the Citizens uh, Advisory Committee and your expo board. Your expo board uh, has taken over some of those duties and I think they're doing a great job and uh, appreciate all their volunteerism. And is Ed Lodge leaving us? Is that what I heard? Yes, Ed Lodge is up and he'll have three terms in there. We normally only go two, but he's been three and he's figured that it's time to bring in some other folks. We've got some good people in waiting. John Sheldon is our vice president. John Sheldon will probably move into the presidency. Kathy Pigeon, I'm gonna guess, is probably the next senior person who runs the Riverside Hotel, has a good uh, grasp on the hospitality industry. All of the folks on the advisory board are very well astute, very intelligent. You and I, Kendra, have picked some, picked a few of them on there. And uh, I, I'm glad that you transferred the responsibility to them because there is a, an abundance of knowledge and skill sets in that room. So I'm privileged to have those folks work with me. Well, make sure we're all invited to the going away celebration for Ed. He's done a remarkable job for us. Ed has been a, Ed has been a, a, a champion for uh, Expo Idaho and the Western Idaho Fair. Yep. Exactly. Again, thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate you. your time. You bet. All right. Uh, I think it's about, uh, about time to take a clerk challenge break. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see him fidgeting down there? Yeah. <laughs>
happenstance thing that we get a three-day weekend for Father's Day now. So uh, I do want to thank all the usual suspects, Phil and Trent and Kathleen and Debbie. Um, all my staff, of course, do a tremendous job as public servants. My colleagues, all the other department directors and office heads, and of course, the Board of County Commissioners here today for uh, you know your patience and understanding this entire week. I know it's been a long week. Hope, hoping to button it up pretty quick here for you. So our department overview, you're welcome to read the mission statement and vision statement. I'm not going to read those for you here today, um, but I will share our core values. Our core values are professionalism, teamwork, accountability, transparency, and stewardship. Uh, every year we're given budget guidelines that come directly from the Board of County Commissioners and the Clerk's Office, and, and really I'm gonna highlight some of those here and then over the course of my presentation, I should hit on each of these. So we're asked to provide our accomplishments from the current and previous year. So, so the questions we're asked are, as a citizen, what do my taxes or county revenue get used for at the county or office level? What services did we provide? What infrastructure was maintained or improved? What efforts were made to save money and what efficiencies were identified? So those are some real key questions in my presentation today. And then, of course, we, we need to hit on the capital projects. Did we request any capital project funds? What's the status of former capital projects? Uh, do we have any new positions? Um, what positions we have, are they filled? Uh, if not, what's the status? And lastly, supplemental requests. Kathleen mentioned a supplemental request I'll hit on briefly here today. Um, some questions were asked regarding those supplemental requests as well. You know, what will it provide? How much will it cost? Things of that nature. As a brief aside, I will say, if anybody is still tuned in from the sheriff's office, I don't have anything for you today, so I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I'll jump right into the numbers here. The parks budget, um, you know, this, this is a, just a touch different from what Kathleen shared, but it's just showing that 200,000 fund balance usage supplemental. So just under $2 million for that parks side. The waterways side is just under 200,000. She'd mentioned that the, there's zero employees. We did shift all our employees over to the parks side of our department so that we could uh, more appropriately uh, move through progressions with um, increase in pay and, and merit increases, whereas we're sort of uh, pinholed down with that waterways fund to where we can't um, develop employees properly under the, the waterways division. So instead, what we do is we, we maximize efficiency and, and put that, that boater revenue uh, funding back into the assets at the lake. And then also, well, this is for the sheriff's office and the Marine Patrol. Uh, we do help fund the Marine Patrol division up at the lake. Uh, so the total there is, is you know, two point about one eight million dollars really small drop in the bucket considering some of the budgets you see today. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to find out what you can't afford to buy for less than $2.18 million today. So when Phil's staff aren't looking for jobs elsewhere, the two thirds of the people, they're probably looking at Zillow to see how much their house might be worth or how much uh, um, they could sell a house for or really trying to find housing. Um, this is shocking to me, honestly. So maybe kind of a little bit of a different approach, but you know, for you can't afford for $2.8 million, $2.18 million today. If you do a search on Zillow of Ada County and you look for homes that are actually 2.18 million or higher, you'll actually find 59 actual houses in, in Ada County. And these aren't like suburb, I mean, these aren't like in the city. If you look, you know, you've got Star, Eagle, uh, and Meridian, you know, suburbs in Ada County. Um, there are now homes. Whoever thought you'd see homes in CUNA uh, for $2.2 million? Um, so you may not be able to afford 59 homes in Ada County, but you can afford to fund your parks and waterways department and management maintenance of the entire where you're going, parks right? <laughs> for one year. So you can buy one year's worth of excellent, efficient management of every uh, park and waterways asset in the county, even if you can't afford these 59 homes. I think the other point that I'd like to make is even if you are, uh, you know, not looking at these types of homes at this value, our employees, you know, these, if, if you live adjacent to these types of 
communities and increases in uh, real estate, you know, it, it affects everybody. We all know the cost of housing is increasing. Um, you know, that the COLA merit discussion is this extremely important discussion this year. And, and I mean, it should at least provide some indication that, you know, we're living in these communities where these home values are skyrocketing. And this is obviously the higher end, but they influence everything down the line. So getting back to some of those questions uh, in, the, in the BOCC's budget um, request here today, as a citizen, what did my taxes or county revenue get used for at the county office level? Well, you know, basically if a citizen wants to know, yes, we, we staffing, uniforms, equipment, fuel supplies, things like that. <coughs> what does that really buy in terms of the services? Well, it is the maintenance operations and management of several different park, open space, <coughs> trail, uh, float season, event center, greenbelt pathway, trailhead parking and recreation sites, uh, the conservation areas, the dock and recreation sites, and also funds the staff that, that implements agency partnerships, MOUs, agreements uh, throughout the county so that we can provide more efficient uh, government countywide. Pictures are worth, you know, more than a lot of words here. So I'm going to kind of jump through the pictures like I like I do on an annual basis. You are aware of Barber Park. It is our department headquarters where all our staff resides, our maintenance shop. Also home to uh, the Barber Park Education and Event Center, which just recently hosted uh, Commissioner Beck's Treasure Valley Partnership meeting. We did have Commissioner Kenyon's Treasure Valley Water Summit out there, which was an excellent event as well that um, really is going to set the table for, I think, a lot of future collaboration uh, countywide. I think we'll be hosting another one here later this fall. Uh, but all kinds of events, um, obviously, that are occurring here at, at Barber Park. Um, lots of different people, lots of different visitors, forward facing, you know, and outside as well. Probably most known in the community, uh, Barber Park is the location that uh, essentially we host. The float season is probably the best way to put it on the Boise River. Um, so everything from the parking, the river floating amenities, the, the shuttle concession, the rental concession, restrooms, building facilities, we're responsible for all of that. <clears throat> so we might as well take a real quick trip down last year uh, memory lane, some important dates and details when we opened the season last year. As Mr. Batista mentioned, you know, we, we are also just now approaching our primary revenue generating uh, season. So we, we have to really make some tricky projections for revenue um, and even expense as we learn through the next few months till the end of the fiscal year. Last year, uh, we had a 76 day operational season. And just kind of some photos from what you might see in the upper left, I think is a good example of a, a former capital project supported by the Board of County Commissioners to, to redesign and construct a new plaza in Barber Park. You can see how it spreads people out a lot further. Um, they make a lot better use of that open space and the plaza and all the flat work and concrete work, the irrigation system and everything else that went into that. So I wanted to thank you for that. I think the public thanks you as well. Some numbers that uh, I think are important to us and, and I won't hover on these next couple slides too long, but I, I do this kind of every year and it, it probably is starting to feel like a broken record, but we're seeing the most in history every subsequent year. We expect this season to be our highest visitation in the history of Barber Park. We expect to have the most revenue in the history of Barber Park. We expect to park the most vehicles um, that we've ever parked in Barber Park, et cetera. So this gives you some idea of the, of the increase, the gross revenue increase of 21%. Um, from 2020 is significant here. Total number of vehicles parked 33,000, which was about 5,000 higher than in any previous season. I attribute that a lot to the efficiencies that we've developed on site, whether that's um, integrating parking staff and assistance or point of sale um, expedited efficiencies at the rental windows, the kiosk operations, everything we're doing is trying to maximize efficiencies in the park so that we can accommodate all the visitors that we will see. Uh, the shuttle increase, total number of shuttle riders was 53,000. The 21% increase is over 2019. As you'll recall in 2020, we had half full shovel shuttles, so we're just due to COVID. So in 2019 was our last full shuttle year to compare, but it was still a 21% increase. 
over the, the former highest shuttle riding year. Again, more increases um, in terms of the total number of four-person raft rentals, total number of six-person raft rentals, two-person kayak rentals, and tube rentals. So anywhere from a 12% increase to a 35% increase in the total number. And all of them um, saw their, their highest daily rentals in each of those particular amenities last season. Why is that important? Well, we do have a contract for that shuttle and, and equipment concession. And so the revenue share to Ada County was 322,000 last year, which was a 40% increase over the prior year. A uh, huge jump. A portion of that was due to an increase in pricing, but a lot of it had to do with the increase in visitation. Kind of give you an understanding of where that tracks over time and in the it, at least a, a 10 year history, 11 year history here, uh, and where we expect to go with parking this year. Same thing with, with the equipment rental shuttle county revenue share. That 2017 was, of course, the flood year, so that's why we have a decrease there, but everything else basically on the rise. Might as well take another aside here since this is kind of a topic of the day in our department. So, when will the 2022 float season begin? Uh, three key components in addition to kind of getting everything ready at Barber Park. The three big things are outside air temperature, existing and projected river flow, river debris and obstructions. And we ask ourselves a lot of questions each year as we approach the season while we're preparing with our contractors, while we're preparing with staffing, preparing the grounds. These questions we ask are, are the daily average high, is the daily high above 80 degrees Fahrenheit? Now, yes, today's high, at least when I sent this presentation in on Wednesday, it was going to be 85. I think we're more about 81. It's going to be the high today. But yeah, we're above 80. Uh, is the extended forecast projected high, uh, to be high above 80 for the foreseeable future? Um, no. Right now, unstable. We're going to get a couple cooler days in there, um, down to 68 or 69 degrees. What about existing and projected river flow? Well, it's been an interesting year. We typically target between 700 cubic feet per second and 1,500 cubic feet per second at Biggie. Biggie is the Glen Glenwood Bridge uh, gauge from USGS. This year, uh, on Wednesday, current flows were, th were 3,140 um, due to flow augmentation and flood control. The, the interesting thing today, though, is that we will be right in that 15 to 1600 range later this afternoon at 8 o'clock a.m. this morning, a 500, an, an additional 500 um, CFS reduction was made in conjunction with other reductions since Wednesday when I typed this in. So we'll be in that 15 to 1600 range today um, through the weekend, and then we expect another decrease probably Tuesday next week. So we are getting close. Um, Will they remain stable between 700 and 1500? What we don't want to do is start a float season, invite um, novice floater recreationists to the river, and then have an increase shortly thereafter due to flow augmentation, flood control, whatever. So uh, right now, we, we think it's going to remain stable once it drops next week, but we'll know more on Tuesday. Um, and then river debris and obstructions, obvious hazards, obstructions identified, located, has Boise Fire Department mitigated those hazards? No and no. Flows have to decrease, then we'll know where the hazards are and then they can be mitigated and removed. So we've got a few steps. I just figured you might be interested in hearing a little bit about that. So a bit of a diversion in the budget, but want you to want you to understand in case you get questions in your office. Uh, and, and when we do make that announcement, we encourage everybody to follow Float the Boise River on Facebook. This is a huge um, interaction we have with the public. All major news media follow it, and this is where we get um, most of the, the notoriety this time of year is through this page when we make that announcement. These are just some, uh, some numbers from last year's announcement. Okay, back to budget. What services did we provide? Um, let's get into that Barber Park Education and Event Center. So year-to-date revenue for 2022, uh, we're at about $85,387. Our anticipated revenue was $100,000. Alcohol sales was $10,358, anticipated $13,000. We have 
June, the remainder of June, July, August, and September, we will far surpass these numbers. September is one of our busiest months, and we do have several events booked in weekdays during the float season. So we will get there. Um, over the course of June 1 to May 31st, we did have 125 event days booked at the event center, very well used event center, uh, with an estimated visitor count of 16,000, um, serving the community, serving the public. We did, as you will recall, we have increased the, um, the fees for rentals that will begin uh, in April of this upcoming year. And so we, we did anticipate a, a bit higher revenue projection for this coming year. Uh, other, other things that you, you services that we provide with the, the tax dollars we receive, of course, Greenbelt, uh, you know, these are former projects. This is what we make them look like when we're done. We do have an ARPA Greenbelt project in the hopper. You've heard a little bit about it from some other directors. That is the Sunrock slash JPD Greenbelt piece. And it will be different than these in that these are asphalt and that will be our first, the county's first concrete um, Greenbelt project because it's in the flood zone. And it will be a $3 million ARPA funded project that we expect to have design services completed by this winter, late spring and go to construction, um, hopefully next spring, summer. The 80 Eagle Bike Park, of course, um, lots of public interaction there. Uh, former landfill buffer area turned into one of the most widely used recreational um, bike facilities, bike specific facilities anywhere in the region, um, definitely in the valley. The Oregon Trail Recreation Area, and I won't spend too much time on these. I'll, I'll get into this photo just a bit later if you have any questions about staffing. Um, you know, we, we do organize kind of volunteer and student days on occasion, and we were able to recruit some seasonal employees that uh, so enjoyed their time during this particular volunteer day that that's becoming the majority of who we're hiring for our seasonal staff now. Victory Wetlands here, partnership with ACHD. Hubbard Reservoir Recreation Area, which is a State Department of Lands lease property that we provide um, for recreational and open space and trail um, amenities for the public down towards CUNA uh, for non-motorized uh, hikers, bikers, and equestrians. And then the open space and conservation areas that recently kind of fell under our umbrella in our management portfolio uh, at Barber Pool and then the Red Hawk uh, area. And lastly here, Lucky Peak Lake. Uh, you all were gracious enough to join us on our Lucky Pe Peak Lake partnership meeting and tour this year. Uh, really appreciated your participation. I know everybody in attendance did as well. Uh, as you learned from that, uh, you know, we do have a very strong local state federal partnership that really is the, I think, a model for leveraging local funding from Ada County um, to also bring in support from Idaho State Department of Parks and Recreation, Army Corps of Engineers, and then others within the community like the Southern Idaho, Idaho Sailing Association. Uh, we do, as mentioned, manage, uh, as Kathleen mentioned, manage all the dock string facilities with the exception of those at Spring Shores. There, circled at the bottom, is are some of those that you'll see at Max Creek. And thankfully, um, another quick update. You know, we talked about going from drought to flood control. This was also on Wednesday. This is uh, base uh, ramp elevations at the boat ramp at Lucky Peak. On Wednesday, we should be full to 3055 um, this weekend. Uh, hopefully today. Um, if not, it'll be shortly after this weekend, which means all of our docks, all of the county docks that are county stamped, will be in the water being used extensively by recreational users throughout the season. And we will have our staff on site, our waterways division staff, and our vessel maintaining, improving, fixing any um, docks that are damaged during the course of the season. Pretty exciting on that bottom right as well. We are um, at full pool, essentially on Arrow Rock and Lucky Peak, and Anderson Ranch is climbing as well. So uh, it's going to be a healthy water year after all.
What services did we provide? Also, public education and outreach, <coughs> social media. I mentioned the Float the Boise River Facebook page. We do have several other pages as well we administer. Um, thanks to your support, last year we were able to hire a, a, a program and education specialist, and he's tasked with a lot of our outreach components at this point. Um, he did resurrect the current newsletter that uh, sat idle for a few years that we started back in when I started in 2013. So we do have a new newsletter. Uh, quarterly newsletter. We updated our website, so now you got these big buttons that we sort of borrowed the idea from the assessor's office website, but gives, uh, gives folks that visit the site a really easy way to interact with all the properties we manage. And we do a lot of volunteer efforts and days. Um, on the left, the planting uh, effort with uh, Golden Eagle Audubon Society and some volunteers over at the Victory Wetlands. Bottom right, um, we hosted an event for Micron at uh, the event center, and they were adamant that they do a volunteer planting or something the day of their event. So we did kind of scramble and put together um, about 40 volunteers and led them in an effort to do some planting in Barber Park and tree wrapping for uh, beaver control. What infrastructure was maintained or improved? Uh, I've mentioned this a couple different times. We were on areas five and six of the master site plan modification for Barber Park. You've heard about some of this during this year's budget. Uh, we had the Barber Park Fishing Pier and Pathways and Bridges Project, six and five and six here. Um, as mentioned, we were replacing the two existing bridges uh, with safety railings, removing the asphalt, replacing with stay lock, and uh, then also seeding those areas and installing a new fishing pier. So we came up with this great fishing pier design. Um, and then we kind of made some a, a few modifications to it, but this was during this last winter. This is uh, under construction with the concrete sauna tube piers, essentially. This is under construction. And then this is what that fishing pier looks like today. So for about $230,000 in fund balance was used for this project. I should note any construction project Anything that we undertake for the benefit of the community with 80 County Parks and Waterways is a tremendous collaboration with other county departments and offices. So it starts with Parks and Waterways. Of course, operations is very much involved. 80 County Procurement, 80 County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, 80 County Development Services from the engineering standpoint is involved. And, and we really all work very tightly and close together to make sure good things are happening in the community. And when it gets into ARPA, then you've got ARPA staff as well. So, you know, we're all working hard to make sure good improvements are there to benefit the community. That's not going anywhere. Look at those, how beefy they are. It's definitely it's not going box. anywhere, Commissioner Kenyon, in a, in a probably a 15,000 year flood event or a 15,000 CFS flood event, it probably won't move. So, yeah, uh, we're pretty happy with it. Tying into that, uh, of course, is the Staylock Pathway and Bridges, which was uh, the first ARPA construction project that the county has undertaken. It's a $650,000 project under the category of aid to tourism, travel, and hospitality. And you have seen some pictures of it during this week's presentations. This was just uh, after the removal of the asphalt. This is uh, earlier last week um, after prepping the, the base and measuring the width of that pathway. Again, prepping and rolling the base. And this is the stay lock that goes down basically with the same, same application as asphalt, but it, it really stitches together and locks together, has more uh, environmentally compliant components, also a paraffin kind of wax material in it as opposed to asphalt. Um, this is it being rolled in, at least in the center. The rest of it is now compacted. The pathway is complete and is actually gonna be open um, to the public on Tuesday. So just wanted you to see kind of what that's looking like. Would love to have you out for a tour. Other budget guidelines mentioned the capital projects and new positions. Um, so did have one CIP request. And I think Richard's going to be up here uh, as soon as I'm done talking about the CIP requests and the transformation board. Unfortunately, our request did not rank very highly this year, but I will implore you to reconsider that during your funding. What this request was for was a parks, open space, and trails master plan. 
And this is a general fund request in collaboration with development services. The first phase would be to do a master plan um, update this year. And the second would basically tie into the transportation action plan that the county um, adopted and really create some, some real moving forward items for, for the future of Ada County. The reason I think this is a critical request is right here. So on the left is our most recent actual plan. I'm gonna circle that, it's April 2007. It's 15 years old. This is our current master plan. There's been a couple of things that have changed in our community in 15 years. I think we probably should update it. Shortly thereafter, there was a presented to the board was the finding recommendations of the task force that was tied to this plan. That's 14 years old. And then more recently, the county did undergo the 80 County 2025 plan, which was actually done in November of 2016. It's a six year old plan. In that plan, there were several components about parks, open space, agriculture, and those kinds of things. But again, still six years old and it wasn't a parks specific plan. So we're well behind. Um, the timing is great because Boise City, Meridian, and several other community partners have just completed master plan updates. Um, and so we can, the county can jump right in, take what good has come from those plans and integrate them and weave them in to a countywide master plan for our department. So as mentioned, I, I hope we actually are successful in getting Scott, that. Scott, Mr. Yes. Chair. Yes. So would there be an opportunity for um, public-private partnership with some of these management of trails, with especially like Havamore and Dry Creek, and a lot of this is up in the foothills, right? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Kenyon, to your point, uh, not, not all in the foothills, kind of all over the valley, but to your point, a master plan will help us determine if public-private partnerships are appropriate for how we manage. Um, it'll help us determine if we're at appropriate staffing levels. It'll help us determine the course of the future. And it will also bring in 15 years worth of new residents' ideas and opinions and thoughts on what they want to see from their Parks and Waterways Department. So we're, we're just kind of missing the boat right now. Is that 250000 for staff uh, or for a consultant? Kind of give us a breakdown of that number. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kenyon, that is uh, directly for hiring of a consultant team to uh, implement a master planning process. The, the figure, as I mentioned, it's split over the course of a couple of years. I did reach out to Boise City and then Steve Sidaway with City Meridian that's just now completing their master planning process to, to refine and fine tune that, that budget figure. So I feel like it's a good, good number for hiring a consultant team. I do have a list of consultants that I think we would reach out to and would work with Ada County procur Procurement to help develop, uh, identify others. And this doesn't or wouldn't qualify for ARPA? I don't think the planning component, Commissioner Kenyon would. I don't. I doubt for the same reasons here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always asking. <laughs> we just got a new tranche in of what 50 million, so <laughs> I'm going to ask. Any other questions on that? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, personnel, no new positions requested this year. Uh, thankfully, we had four new that we hired last year thanks to your support. Um, we, we did hire two maintenance mechanics, promoted two into maintenance supervisor positions. And then we also, uh, as I mentioned, the, the uh, program and education specialist position was hired and filled, and then the trail crew foreman position. We do actually right now have two positions currently vacant. That's just occurred in the past two months. We're working towards re-staffing and determining how to move forward with those, perhaps recruiting from seasonal pools. So we were at seven for years and years, and then we're, we're now at 11. Supplemental request, this is the last item here, is $200,000 uh, one-time supplemental request using fund balance for Barber Park playground equipment upgrade. That's what our playground looks like. This is uh, an example of a $200,000 playground um, that would fit in the space that we have at Barber Park. And lastly, the question of what efforts were made to save money and what efficiencies were identified. I'm gonna share with you just a microcosm kind of story uh, that I think represents who we are as a department and kind of the type of people that work for us. And it starts with a mule. 
So a Kawasaki Mule is sort of our weapon of choice for management and maintenance of Barber Park and, and most of the green belt that we manage. Now on this mule, you'll notice the back of that mule has, a, has an 80 County Parks and Waterways logo on a cage. This is a tool cage that after we, uh, after staff was assigned to investigate what types of more efficient operations could we deploy in each mule and each staff member as they leave the park to go five miles sometimes down the greenbelt to manage the pathway. And after researching market, you know, what was out there that you could just purchase, our team um, consisting of uh, Tom and Jared, not Tom and Jerry, Tom and Jared, from our parks division and our waterways division came up with uh, basically using scrap materials primarily uh, this custom designed, um, due to Jared's welding skills, uh, tool cage. Now this tool cage, fully loaded, can bring just about everything you need from a seasonal perspective, whether it's winter, spring, summer, fall, onto the green belt. The bed remains fully open and operational. It can still tilt. You can put a pole saw and a ladder on top and you can take a blower, you can take a line trimmer, uh, your, your push brooms and shovels, everything we need um, so that we're not inefficient with our deployment of people and resources and material can be placed on that. Now this was a challenge for these two staff members and they rose to the challenge and not only did they rise to the challenge and create this, but it also developed camaraderie, pride in what they do and really represents what we always try to do in parks and waterways, which is take something okay and make it much, much better. <clears throat> These types of people, employees, are the people you have working for you and for the citizens as public servants. It's really important to retain these people that are working their tails off for the, for the service of the public. And uh, you know, I really implore you, as you've heard all this week, the, the COLA, um, the cost of living in this community has increased so significantly. Um, all my staff are hourly employees. Uh, we really need to reward and keep these and retain these people. Uh, they're doing a tremendous job. So with that, there's another look at the budget that was submitted, and I will stand for any questions. Well, thank you, Scott. Appreciate your your efforts. Are there questions uh, from the from the commission? Yeah. Um, so good job. I think, like you said, you know, your budget's fairly small, but the amount of value that you add to the community is, uh, you can't even measure it because it just makes Boise and, and the surrounding area what it is, you know, having all the amenities on the river, especially in the trails and the foothills. So thank you for that, for doing a lot with not very much. Thank um, you. I think for me, instead of really talking anything specific about the budget, um, is really looking at the opportunity right now for Eckert uh, Street and the bridge. I think that we've identified in the past, we've had meetings with ACHD, that's a hazard and it really causes a bottleneck and it's a, you know really safe to concern for all of us and it's an old bridge. We just yesterday got another email um, that there's more funding for bridges. And so it was suggested that we do an application um, to meet with LTAC and LTAC is our local um, technical advisory committee, and that if we could maybe use um, our connections with Compass and put in um, a request with all of the money that we have sitting there for bridges, it may be the time. So I think let's kind of all rendezvous after budget and figure out if we can make that happen. Sounds great, yes, appreciate that. And uh, I think there will be a lot of employees and visitors that would be very happy to see that that bridge built and, a, and even just a turn lane to, to allow for a turn lane in and out of Barber Park would, would make a tremendous impact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Well, unless you want to talk about uh, air pumps and how that situation continues <laughs> Parking. to <laughs> Parking evolve. and air pumps, yeah. <laughs> the usual, right? Uh, Mr. Beck, Commissioner Davidson, I'm sure we'll hear somewhat about that during the course of the season. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, with the increase in visitation and, and population increase in growth and the development of the communities and neighborhoods in the vicinity of Barber Park, much like, you know, commit, or, uh, Director Batista indicated, you know, when, you, when you're there and you're built up around <coughs> you, there are implications just as if you move in next to a, a dairy or something. You know, there, there are definitely some, some seasonal implications of living nearby Barber Park. And, uh, 
you know, that's it, it, it can create some issues throughout the course of the summer. All the more reason why we've done everything we can, including retiring the air stations for uh, creating better efficiencies in the park. Our whole objective is to reduce the amount of time that folks spend in Barber Park. Let's get them on the river, let's get them moving, let's get them um, efficiently addressed and parked and rented equipment if they're renting and, and on the river and, uh, and returned and out. You know, that's, that's kind of our responsibility with such a limited space um, and we do the best we can. Well, thank you for your presentation and uh, looking forward to the float season this year. Thank you. Me too. Did we flush all the minnows down when we let all the water out <laughs> so the fishing is going to be poor? Well, uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kenya, I think it's, you know, it's actually probably been more beneficial now uh, for downstream in particular. This cold water in the Boise River system yeah, uh, is really beneficial to, to the lower snake in the Columbia Basin for salmon migration and spawning. So um, maybe some short-term, you know, issues here but uh longer term it's for the benefit of the greater fishery so i think it's a good thing have you ever um experienced what we experienced when we were out at your place last week when you go from drought conditions um within 24 hours 48 hours to flood conditions mm -hmm. that dramatic increase really surprised me no commissioner kenyon i think we'll probably hear more about it from a lot of the water managers as they reflect upon the data over the last two weeks really and that 48 hour period was surprising we've never seen it but not only hadn't we you were up at Lucky Peak with us the week prior, and it was told to us in no uncertain terms, the lake will not be full. We will be 20 feet short of the docks all season. And within one week, that changed completely, not only filling Lucky Peak, but filling Arrow Rock and possibly Anderson Ranch, unheard of. So a lot of those water managers, I think, are, are looking at that and, and indicating it was probably maybe a once in 50 year or longer type of event where that happens. So no, it, it's very unusual, Shocking. very atypical. And uh, we're, we're just adjusting and adapting as, as we get more information. Well, it was really interesting, the USDA uh, report on the climate change. I don't think that this is gonna be a one-off anymore. We're looking at these types of conditions more frequently. So it's gonna be tougher to manage. Thank you, right. Well, I did hear on the radio coming into work this morning that, uh, that uh, Lucky Peak was gonna be at 3,055. And I distinctly remember the, the, the managers up there telling us we're at 335 and that's gonna to be tops. And I'm going, well, that, that, the, the, snow, rain dance. the snow and the rain uh, helped out a lot. And, and, and that's gonna be, I'll have all of, our, all of our docks out of the water and it's gonna be for a better, uh, better irrigation season and, and, and everything and for a better, better float season. And sometimes you just can't predict those kinds of things, can you? But uh, anyway, on the, uh, on the compressor, I'm not convinced that if, even if we turn that compressor back on, it would change anything, in my view. What do you think? Mr. Chairman, I'm convinced we've, we've lived through it, and I'm convinced it would make a tremendous bottleneck in Barber Park. That's what we no, saw the last time we. No, operated. well, what I mean, change it won't change the the, the the objections that they have for us not having. Correct. It. Yeah, I don't yes, think that I'm would sorry. change. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, Mr. Chair, I, I misunderstood. Yes, I I don't think it changes what happens with sort of the parking and population increase pro problem outside of Barbara. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I'm re referencing. Yes, I think you're exactly right. Yeah, I think it's just it's just a. If they can blame somebody, they'll blame us. Right. <laughs> and that's what seems to be happening. In fact, I think it exacerbates the problem throughout that whole region of Barber Park and the surrounding neighborhoods. We, we did see that, and that's why we made the change. So the plaza that you invested in has done a tremendous job um, for really spreading out visitors a lot better and you know, influencing folks to be prepared and bring their own equipment has been very helpful. So we appreciate all the support. Well, the plaza gets them on the river faster, does it not? Correct. The, the yeah. increase, the, the benefits of that increased plaza gets them on the river faster. Which it is all for efficiency's sake, yep. Yes, and by, by not having that that uh, compressor, it does spread out the, make, make people spread out in the park and it's a, a much more pleasant park experience, I think. It is, Mr. Chair. The way I look at it is that if you're going to a BSU football game, you wouldn't put your filling stations for beer before you even enter the stadium and make everybody go through that, that 
congestion. And that's really what we have there is that the main primary launch points are right there in front of our two designated stairway access areas. And it just creates congestion and it slows down everybody's progress through the park throughout the course of, a, of an hour, let alone an entire day. And so that compounds over the course of time, people spill out over into the neighborhoods and. And that's the problem we have. So we do the best we can. We appreciate your support. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're going to have a long, a long, and a prosperous float season this year. Now that we're uh, we're back up to full pool, right? <laughs> yeah. Pray for us. We've got a lot of we got seventy days of chaos coming our way. I'm sure. So we uh, it's a very trying time for staff. I mean, this is a is a very big challenge. We rise to the challenge every year, and my staff very proud of everybody that does everything they can to support what we do for the public. Um, you know, we have regular jobs throughout the course of the year, full-time jobs. Right. And then this, you know, two and a half month period of time is like an entirely new job for everybody on top of what we already do to run the County Parks and Waterways Department. Now on our concessionaire, uh, I understand there's been some changes there uh, or, 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 or is there going to be any changes in the future? Correct. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, as you know, the, the former owner uh, did sell the concessionaire uh, or, or the rental concession to another party. That party um, is the, the Galena group. They go by the name of Boise River Runners. It is the same management and uh, she is a consultant. There would there will be no front end changes to all the efficiencies we've adopted. She will be on site throughout the duration of the season. We don't expect to only to get better at what we do is, is the only expectation we have. So yeah, new new parent company, I guess, is the best way to, to put it. But um, yeah, I don't, I expect it to be same tremendous outreach and, and service provided to visitors to the park. Well, great. Well, once again, I want to thank you for your service to the community. I think it's, it's, it's a valuable asset for, for Ada County. And uh, you, you're a large part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Scott, I just sent you the email. It looks like counties uh, can apply directly for funding for bridges now. Okay. So I'll send that to you. Let's circle back and get a meeting on that. Okay. Let's and build that. a bridge. <laughs> Go bridge. Bridge. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Chairman, we are to about that point give me a second just to pull up things that we're going to adjust slightly compared to what your agenda says um, at the moment just because uh, bruce has had a busy morning and i wanted bruce to be here when we talked about the master's facility plan so we'll talk about the mfp briefly first and then richard is prepared to go over the review from the transformation board with the cips and everything and then talk about next week okay so So I'm going to pull up, you've already seen this uh, on Monday, so I'll just pull up the listing for the master's facility plan um, and, and both uh, Mike and Bruce are here um, just to try and address any questions. I think, you know, one of the things it was discussed during our um, department head and elected officials meeting earlier this week kind of where this fits in. Um, Jess Oslo was kind of leading a, a refresh, looking at some of the numbers that's been compiled. Um, Bruce pulled together some of the other uh, PowerPoint presentations that we have for the master facility plan, but I don't think, I think both of us agree that they don't really fit with what we're discussing here at this point in time, right, in terms of it. I've highlighted the three projects that are kind of under discussion or underway. Right, we've got the corners facility. Obviously, we had the groundbreaking recently, so that that one is kind of full fledged moving forward. Right, so it, it's at the most complete stage. Um, as you're very well aware, drug treatment center has been talked about uh, at length. Uh, the I updated the estimates on the cost of that um, from what we've heard from operations, um, and then I've also updated the estimates on the jail expansion uh, that is up here. All these projects are from the original master's facility plan, so it's not like the prioritization has changed. We've, we haven't brought people back together to review the, the holistic plan at any point in time. Um, one thing I noted as I was reflecting, kind of preparing to talk about it this morning, one of the things you had alluded to this, Commissioner Kenyon, is the, the ownership of the master's facility plan and the advocacy of it. Um, I think this is one of the master's facility plan, its genesis on why it exists, really reflects it. These are the most challenging things we have, 
right? And, and that's one of the things. There's a commonality with the three projects that are highlighted and that that is they each have, I'll call it a single beneficiary, right? Uh, the coroner is obviously the chief advocate for the coroner's facility because she is most impacted uh, by that change. The sheriff is clearly the, the greatest advocate for the jail expansion because it's his operation that benefits from that. Um, Sandra is uh, tenacious and uh, <laughs> undeterred by any resistance when it comes to the drug court facility. <laughs> um, <coughs> and so I think that actually stands out. One of the challenges, I think you could hire someone, it was kind of suggested in the meeting, but I don't think they'll ever be the full advocate. The advocates end up being the people who really need the space. Um, one of the things that I've seen through some of the budget presentations this week really our our big challenge uh certainly by dollars is the jail leading at the top you guys do your jail inspections you know the numbers the pop the census numbers at the jail i think bigger to, though are number two and number four um, you did hear from numerous departments uh, in terms of the space constraints in this building in particular um, that is becoming and it and you look at those price tags that is one of the biggest challenges what's awkward about it is there are there is no single owner right? But we all collectively share this space and we all bump into each other or barter for space uh, in this building, each turning closets into offices. Um, there, we're running out of closet space in this building uh, because it's all being converted. And I, I do think that's one of the biggest challenges. So somehow there needs to be a culmination of leadership to discuss how we're going to do these. But the jail really is actually a really good precursor to this. Uh, as we've learned from our conversations, um, it's going to take additional funding sources for many of these projects. I think in this budget, I think next week as we head into deliberations, discussion of the drug treatment uh, center should probably continue. Um, we've made headway. There's obviously finding the real estate agents that you guys have hired to find a location, but setting aside money to be able to pull the trigger on something, we're probably in a good place with our fund balance and other things to try and figure out how to tackle that next week. Um, beyond that, most likely public financing is the only way I can envision that we will ever, you know, it's either public financing for the jail or stop spending money on every single thing, like do not fund anything else so that we can save up funding, which is not realistic, right? We, we know that. Um, uh, you know, the one thing with the jail, and I'm sure Bruce can add more information to, uh, uh, there's always the timing question on when you make that ask. I think that fits into some of our economic projections uh, that we've touched on just a little bit. Um, both in terms of people's rising expenses, but also are we headed towards a recession matters in that. Um, uh, the other piece and probably the, uh, I'm Commissioner Beck, you bring it up all the time, is kind of need to own the land before we build on it. Uh, and, and as long as I've been around that, that's been a lingering question. Mm -hmm. When will we get the land, right? And so I, I think, you know, I think, uh, like I said, Bruce, Mike are here can answer any questions that might help as it relates. I think for this year's budget, uh, the drug treatment center is probably the, the question on the table uh, among these, unless you see differently among the projects. But I think that's where we are at the moment. But I, I do think there is a larger question about how do we try to tackle these things. Well, I think to add to the um, conversation, uh, Mr. Chair, that this board has met with um, our consultants and uh, we're, I think they're coming back with um, a plan for us, we're looking at public-private partnerships on the two um, uh, lots in front of the Civic Plaza, as well as they've added in the Triangle lot now. So really looking at more holistically kind of tackling some of the admin uh, issues that we're having, some of the parking issues, how can we do a public-private partnership in addition to some affordable housing that's really needed, uh, particularly at St. Luke's and in Boise State here, um, which seems to be a great location. So we should have some information on that in the next month or two, which will be helpful for this conversation, I think. Um, and then looking at what Bob McQuaid had to say with ITD taking over some of their um, job duties and whatnot and possibly having to identify where those locations should be and maybe doing an analysis about where we're seeing the public. And so there might be opportunities right here on this campus to do some switching of folks around and whatnot to help alleviate, I think, some of those spaces. So yeah, it takes, it takes creativity. Like you said, if you don't have a champion, a sheriff or a coroner, it really does take one person to sort of lead this and, and understand, I think, you know, um, it's 
you need to be innovative and out of kind of out of the box thinking on how we're going to get some of this stuff done. And it's and it's hard. We've been putting six million that towards it, but that's a drop in the bucket, as you noted. Um, I think last year the cost, the increase, and, and Bruce, you did as well. For example, the jail went from thirty million, thirty-two million, to now fifty-two to sixty million in less than three years. And even in the update, so the the two thousand one update of figures, I was just looking over the numbers, and it was at forty-eight, um, or I was forty, I was mid forties. But it, but to your point, it's it's yeah, it it just keeps jumping, right, and not small jumps, right. Hopefully, so. yeah, it'll calm down a little bit. We won't see these huge leaps year after year. But the fact is, um, it, yeah, we've got to start planning for this long term or it's not going to happen. Any other questions regarding the master facility plan? Uh, nope. Do you have any questions, Commissioner? Yeah, I guess that would be a similar issue with the faces, too. It's finding land and... Or is that re remodel? Uh, faces is probably a matter of two things as far as I, I know with faces and uh, Bruce chime in, but one is just prioritization. Where does it fit on the list? There's other projects that, and that was part of why, the genesis of the master facility plan was to prioritize because you had every, normally all of these things, you would have juveniles saying, I need a new building. You would have, and we we're trying to say, we, that's not productive to just everyone ask mm -hmm. for something. So the prioritization, so I think it's priority. Um, and then it probably would be location. There have been talks in the past with some of the other land issues. I mean, I think you're well aware Marriott has an interest yeah. in the space that's there. Yeah. Um, and we might note that this also should be um, a partnership. This, uh, I don't think that the, um, the facility cost should um, rest solely on Ada County. As you know, it's a great partnership with um, the hospitals and with you know everyone else. There's probably six or seven partners in this. So I think we need to probably look at that particular location that it's in now. And um, if we do move it to a better location, which there's probably a lot better locations in the middle of right downtown, um, St. Luke's or St. Al's, you know, helping with, with that. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges we face with all of this, I know uh, Bruce sees this all the time, is uh, Ted Argyle he used to have Heather McCarthy's job. Uh, he warned when he, when he left is that we need to get a hold of as much land as we can. Right, I mean, you think of Scott's uh, presentation and his Zillow tour, uh, that the, the parcels are becoming one of our, but there's construction costs is one thing, but you can't build on anything if you don't own the land, right? And so um, I think that's gonna continue to be, yes, uh, where Faces is is kind of an awkward placement, but it still does need to be near the hospital, so it has to be uh, in kind of the downtown core. And it would make sense developers with all the are, tax breaks we give them that yeah. they could help out with that. <laughs> Yeah, that would. <laughs> yeah, wishful thinking. You want to add anything, Bruce? I, I do. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, it's sure. an important thing to uh, realize when we do these remodels or relocations or any of these projects is we just can't go in and remodel. We have to have that particular department or office, whatever it may be, function the, the whole time we're, we're constructing another building or another site. We need to have that site secured. We need to have uh, an ability to construct uh, and not interfere or reduce the ability of all the departments and offices to fully function. Um, just doing remodels here in the courthouse, for example, we have to do after hours so we don't interrupt the courts or any of the other folks that are in here doing uh, business with the public. So um, it's very problematic. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So. <clears throat> You know, we've looked at this now for, you know, three of us for three years, um, and we've had the consultants kind of try to come in and help with some of it, but I'm not convinced outside consultants really understand the full nuances of how we work and, and at the pace of how things change and public-private partnerships and leverages and all of those things. So if we had to fund a position or if there's some existing position that could take this on, would that be a better way to go? I would think so. Um, I think we can handle this internally and come up with our own master facilities plans, means and methods, much like the CIP, where we make our case and it gets put on that list and prioritized. Um, I don't think, and Phil nailed it by, I don't think putting this out to another consultant to do a massive thousand page plan would Helpful. help our cause at all. Mm -mm. No. So. 
I do think it could help to just compiling all the information, right? We've looked at the Department of Labor building. We've discussed the HP campus, um, the things around here years ago, to Bruce's point about having to, to stage people. Um, the I'm going to call it the former MK building that just shows how long I've lived here uh, um, uh, as a space to just lease space while we try to renovate this building, right? Because there are certainly renovations necessary here. Um, but it does take some long-term planning. Uh, mm -hmm. None of these are small projects. Yeah. It almost does take a full-time position, I think, to get this done, and especially to help with the financing piece of it, what that looks like in public-private partnerships, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? I'm, I'm good. You're good. You're good. I don't have more questions. Good. Okay. I think uh, then we can shift gears towards Richard Beck just to talk about, go over the... CIP EOE that you've heard about. Can I back up just for a second? Yep. Um, so I'm looking at Trent and Kathy. Did uh, Jess's position, is is that still in at 50, 50, or 25, 75? Or were those eliminated? It, uh, I believe it, I, Bruce might know better. I believe it's been cannibalized to a certain degree. We're working on doing that, you're right. And then increasing it over on the landfill side for a full director. OK. We'll talk, yeah, to yeah. you. Okay, all right. We're working on a whole plan on that, yeah. by the way. All right. Okay. Okay, do you know what? It's down below. It's already open. It's already up. Yeah, the middle one. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the, <clears throat> the board. As I was uh, wrapping up my own budget presentation and thinking about this and thinking about how all the offices and departments have had a chance to express their, their specific needs for, for capital projects, I realize, as uh, Director Koberg said, I didn't express my, my own. I did want to add real quick uh, my own support to the uh, update to the, the parks and trails update. Um, as uh, I think I mentioned in my budget presentation, the uh, county recently adopted our transportation action plan, and that is one of the one of the steps is looking at the non-motorized uh, modes of transportation, something that we can do. And as as Scott had indicated, I think there's only one of the six cities in the county that hasn't recently updated their 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 plans or in the process of doing so. So it's definitely a good time, and I think the. The, the ask for this fiscal year is just $150,000. So definitely want to just uh, throw my support out there as well for that that effort um, as we move forward. But uh, and where is that in the is that in the EOE? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kenyon, I'll, I'll highlight. I'll, I'll point that out yeah. here. But I just um, it, yeah. yeah, I'm just going to quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, highlight uh, highlight the capital investment program, just uh, give you an overview and take a look at the specific projects that have been submitted for FY23, uh, and then just walk through the recommendations that the Ada County Transformation Board has submitted for your consideration as you try to wrestle through how to prioritize all the needs that you've been hearing about all week. And so um, I do want to thank the members of the Transformation Board. They uh, each year spend a lot of time looking at these projects um, they don't typically relate to their, their area of expertise or their, their department or office, but they spend a lot of time and they come together and it's been impressive to watch them as they, they collaborate and come up with a recommendation uh, for you to consider. also want to uh, thank Kelly Woodworth and Development Services. She's our administrative coordinator who uh, keeps, keeps the, the CIP moving forward each year. So um, as far as the capital investment program itself, it's just an annual program that establishes a uniform approach for our offices and departments to submit applications and that, it, that uh, relate to capital needs in excess of $100,000. They're considered by our transformation board. Uh, they may ultimately make a recommendation on priority uh, to better inform you as the capital needs are presented uh, during the budget hearings and the, the deliberations. To help our uh, our transformation board better compare the requests 
when considering the priority, our projects are separated into two types. There are CIP projects and EOE projects. And I think you've, you've kind of heard these interspersed throughout, <laughs> throughout the presentations this week. The, the CIP projects are those traditional capital projects that relate to investments in our physical facilities and assets. It could be land acquisition, building construction, um, anything, any kind of improvement to long, long lived fi fixed assets related to our facilities. And then the EOE project types are extraordinary operational expenses. And the key word there is operational. They, they help us support our operations of our facilities and our services. Uh, could be acquisition of equipment, replacement of software, and those type of things. So in response to our um, call that Development Services issued in, I think it was November or December, uh, we received 11 CIP um, applications and 22 EOE applications. Out of the CIP applications, four of them called for the use of general funds. Five uh, did not require any funding from the general fund, and two were related to updates for existing projects that were already part of the FY22 program that weren't going to be completed in the, the current fiscal year. And then on the EOE, EOE side, we received 22 applications, 17 calling for the use of general funds. Two didn't call for any general funding. And then three were already part of the FY22 program, but rolling over. <clears throat> and just for the sake of clarity, I think there, there I sense potentially some, some, some confusion on this. I want to quickly dive into what we received. Um, this chart on the screen depicts what we received for those CIP requests. Um, and so when it came down to prioritization, um, what, what is reflected in or highlighted in red on the screen, those are the projects that the Transformation Board focused on for prioritization recommendation because they were calling for the use of general, general funds. The, the projects in yellow um, should have been included by the requesting officer department as part of their regular budget request. Uh, in this case, the particular case for the CIP, uh, Mr. Audi, he covered these in his solid waste budget presentation. So they were included in his budget request. And then the, the remaining projects in green, again, are existing projects that will, uh, that are either um, underway, but most likely will not be completed this fiscal year and will roll over to FY23. And then on the EOE side, uh, the same pattern's true. We had um, 17 projects calling for the use of general funds. Uh, the two projects in yellow were covered by Direct o Director O'Meara as part of the Sheriff's uh, Emergency um, Communications Bureau budget. And and Mr. Chair, yes. those are the ones I was trying to track of where, where they left the transformation board and how they didn't land in his budget and they didn't land on our EOE. Yeah, so Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kennedy, I know Director O'Meara is here, but he did cover those and I believe they were part of that Emergency Communications Bureau budget request. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's... I'll go back in the binder and yeah. look, but I couldn't find the, uh, the project cost. I'll look. Okay. Yeah. And we can follow up for sure on that. And then again, uh, there were three uh, committed projects a, a part of the FY22 um, capital investment program. We, we did hear from, uh, from Director Schroeder that one of these will, be, will not be pursued, the, the generator, based on the, the, the massive increase in costs. So we'll see that one come back. But I think the other two are, are moving forward, are committed, and uh, may need to roll over into the FY23 program. So um, the Transformation Board considered all of those projects. Um, they then developed a priority recommendation on just the ones calling for general funds. At their April prioritization meeting, they considered four CIP projects with a com combined total of just over 9.7 million. Um, prioritized two of them as important and urgent, and two as important but not uh, non-urgent. They identified the uh, public safety building homicide evidence storage expansion project as the number one CIP 
uh, project. And then uh, moving over to the EOE side, um, they evaluated 17 projects with a combined total anticipated cost of just over 11.2 million and prioritized 12 of the 17 as important and urgent and the remaining five is important but non-urgent. And again, here on the EOE, for the EOE uh, program, the number one priority is the fab replacement uh, project. And I'll pull up a table that shows all of these combined. So this depicts all uh, 14 projects uh, prioritized by the Transformation Board as important and urgent. Again, a cost of just over 19 million. And then the seven um, important and non-urgent projects came in just below 2 million. The Transformation Board's main recommendation is, is that you as a board consider funding as many of the important and urgent projects as possible um, in the recommended priority order. And then should funding be available, then move on to the um, important but non-urgent projects. Mr. Chair. Yes. So we've had conversations um, with uh, Sandra Barrios on the drug a problem uh, court treatment center. We've been able to find two properties uh, within the last two or three months that would have been adequate, um, which have fallen short of the 8.7 million. Plus now we have Beechwood on the market. And so I think that numbers uh, needs to be really talked about next week. Pull that out because it's not at 8.7 any longer. Are you saying to increase that number? No, a decrease. It's going, it was, we found properties that, that were coming in less. Would those properties need any renovation? They did. That included. Um, uh, um, Commissioner, um, that's, I think that number should remain. The reason being is that we'll have to buy a new building. Uh, two, um, there will be some renovations required to uh, make it usable for the drug court folks. But Sandra will get 2.5 oh, okay. out of the building, give or take. Right, but that will cover. Only if it sells for, so I, yeah, on to that point, we've talked about this. Yes. We need to budget the full amount. Right. It will be paid back when the, when the existing building sold. Either that or you have to wait until you sell the existing building before you can do anything on a new building. Right, this was the issue that came up uh, when you approached me in the year is we need to have the money available. So if you had a building now that you found that you could have that money, it will be then when the other property is sold, that money will go basically sup of refill the general fund for the, the portion the drug court pays for. Um, so some of this is a, a cash flow thing. The good, the mm -hmm. one thing about this too though is let's say it's budget 8.7, it ends up costing 7 million. I don't know, I'm making the number up. Yeah, the no, the right. remainder will go back into the fund balance, the same source it came from. So it's not it's not hurting us. Well, unless we that issue we keep running into is it's underfunded, not overfunded. Well, I thought the uh, we had been told that the um, the re, any monies we spend, and then we if we sell the 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 property for two point five million or whatever it is, that that's designated for drug court. You can't put it back in the general account. Is that right? You, you can. No, it, yes, but the drug court portion can pay for drug court. So the money's tied up. It's a cash flow problem that we're talking about, not a, the rules. Yes, the drug court money is dedicated for drug court and must go towards drug court. It just happens the drug court money is currently held in a, in a building, in an asset, and we need to liquidate it. To, to be able to get a new asset and so exactly and that's the question if we spend if we spend the general account monies and build a building and remodel it and so forth and then sell the drug corp building we can't can we replenish yes the we general can account yes with we that? can yes i thought that was okay yeah, yeah we can we've reviewed it with ammon we've got we figured out how to do it <laughs> the issue we're running into right now is cash flow because no, okay. the drug corp money right. is tied okay, up but i think we, we can deliberate over this next week but i think yeah. this board was very clear that we're not spending eight to nine million dollars that that is well worth discussing next. Yeah. That is your the yeah. cap you want to put on it for sure. Yeah. That right. I'm not trying to weigh in on that so much as let's whatever money we might need we we don't want to shortchange it because we keep right. running into this cash flow problem. And then can you um, Richard uh, or Bruce on the closet switching upgrade um, tell us about that and the urgency of that? That's at 1.6 million. <laughs> I heard Steve. 
that's, uh, that's covered in our new IT spec, and I'll let Mr. O'Mara speak to that. <laughs> yes, those are all of the, uh, good morning again. Good morning. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Commissioner, uh, those are the um, greater parts of the network away from the cores which are on here. The core would be what's in the data center, switches are all the pieces out throughout all the offices throughout this courthouse. Um, those are all coming up at their end of useful life and soon we'll be having support issues with those and so it's time that they go. Um, and um, So what's the difference, so you've got the course switching upgrade hmm? and then the switching upgrade, closet switching upgrade, wouldn't you do those at the same time? I guess I don't understand why they'd be separate projects. Uh, because they are separate things. Um, they are, and individually they're, there's a large quantity of switches and there's obviously not nearly the amount of cores that has to do with the main brains in the data center. So they really are different things. Um, of course, if we round them together, it would be one even larger project. So I'm trying to so, split them out. I guess for, I'm just, again, this is really hard for me to get my head around all the various, you know, especially the IT ones, the innovation and the growth and the, you know, what's maintenance, what's repairs, what's upgrades, what's new, all of that. So I think I'll look at your, the sheet that you provided to me about an hour or so ago over the weekend, but if you can come back Tuesday. I'll be ready. Okay, then I'll probably have some uh, questions that are more coherent at, the, <laughs> at that time. <laughs> no problem at all. No guarantees. <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll okay. deal with it then. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, Mr. Chairman and, and commissioners, in addition to that primary recommendation of funding as much as possible um, based on those uh, urgent and important projects, the Transformation Board did have a few other um, recommendations that I was going to walk through real quick if that's okay sure so they did um for the very first one there on the list they did recommend that uh might be prudent to explore the potential of having boise city contribute to that uh, that project we did follow up with director bolacek she did confirm that the city is already under contract to help pay kind of under a lease scenario so what does that mean? Does this number change? Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kennedy, I don't believe this number would change at all. It's just that the city is compensating the county for the use of that facility. Okay. And then the second uh, recommendation from the Transformation Board uh, is about the, uh, the Drug and Problem Solving Court Treatment Center um, remodel. Basically, they had indicated or recommended that if it can't be fully funded this year, that a leasing option be considered. They and did. how much what would we put in for a leasing option and then what is in Sandra's um, fund balance? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kennedy, they didn't provide any specific guidance on, on amounts. Okay. And then what's the new fund balance again, Sandra? Um, Kathleen can tell you on the fund balance. Um, I am requesting to allocate one million this One year? million and out of your fund balance, okay. So that would leave like three hundred thousand left in fund balance. In her fund balance, yeah, okay. I still it's probably higher because I think you have that budgeted this year as well. Yes. Yeah. So it is. It, so it would be nice one point three. Yeah. Sorry. But we can count on a good one million. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the next recommendation coming from the Transformation Board, con again considered uh, that the, uh, what Director Amir just addressed was the closet switching upgrade in the concept of considering uh, essentially phasing phasing that um, using uh, EC, ECF funding to accomplish some of them this year and general funding in a future year. While that may be possible, as Director Amir had presented in his budget presentation, it's preferred to do them all at once to make sure we have actually had the same product and not ended up with two different types of, of, of equipment that have to be patched together and, and much more difficult to maintain. You know, Richard, because we have all these uh, being consolidated from Steve O'Mara, um, it might be helpful for us to do this next week, honestly, 
um, because there's so many of the IT projects on here. If you can maybe just not go through the IT ones, because uh, I think we'll tackle that together and just skip to the yeah. ones that are not IT. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kenyon, you could certainly do that. I think that was the last IT recommendation from the Transformation Board, so. Okay. The next, they on the uh, jail security BMS and building ACLS refresh project, um, they suggested considering adding that to the jail expansion or jail addition project. And in following up with uh, Chief Deputy uh, so he in had indicated that that was originally the intent. However, when the Sheriff's Office met to consider their capital needs in January, uh, not knowing exactly where that project was going to go, this this particular need still remains. Um, they're concerned about continued um, degradation to the uh, to this equipment and, and the pot potential for critical failure. So they're still wanting to include this in the program. So would this, if we allowed this this year, and then we ended up with the jail expansion next year, for example, would we have wasted money? Um, on this? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Kenney, I don't believe so. I think they can still upgrade the existing facility with this equipment, and then with the expansion, they'd have, have to equal, uh, add this equipment to that new new construction. So I don't necessarily believe it would be a waste, but I'd have to have the, I don't know if. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the, the suggestion, it's not so much, I don't want to say wasting money, but you're using existing counting funds, right? Whereas any of the infrastructure costs for the jail, if we're going to be going out to bond for the jail, they can all be incorporated. So you're adding, it's more that by going, including them in any bond issuance, you'd actually be adding additional funding to cover these costs. And then that would free up the existing fund, the funding we'd be talking about now for other projects, right? Because right now it competes with everything else. Yeah, I, I guess my question is though, a little bit beyond that um, would be, if it's a refresh, does it, and we have a new building, does it then mesh in with what the new capacity mm -hmm. would be, the requirements? And so I don't know if we have enough information here because that's where I'm seeing that we would spend the money and then it's like, and then take out years, what we just installed. Take, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's where it gets fun, people. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Hello. Cool. Um, that. Uh, that is the effectively the brains where the software lives, and it's similar to our our routers and server and switches that need to be replaced. That server stack needs to be replaced. So whether you you <clears throat> expand the building or not, that equipment needs to be money well taken spent. care of. And expanding the building, we would just connect into it basically. Um, not, I think I understood where the uh, clerk and grain was going. We wouldn't want to push this out too long because of that aging equipment. I don't, I don't know how long a bond takes, literally way outside my scope. We wouldn't want to wait for that for this equipment because if it has a problem, we have problems today with, with the software that they're running in the current jail. So that's why it's presented now, kind of separate from the expansion. Why did it break 12 if it's critical or important? Why is it number 12? Um, not really sure. I think that Probably, I believe this was pre uh, presented by the chief deputy. I think um, you said as far as criticality goes, um, it's not as old as maybe some of the other equipment that we're looking at here. It's something that needs to be done and it can't be put off too far. Um, okay. I don't exactly remember that. I have to apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two more. <laughs> um, the next recommendation from the Transformation Board, um, they, they just noted that the number uh, number 15 there, the, the jail inmate tracking system, if a number, let me see, there we go, if number six, if, the, if that particular enterprise jail management migration um, project is not approved, then this other one would not, would, uh, would not need to be approved as well because it's contingent upon the, the funding of the first one. Okay. And lastly, the Transformation Board is recommending that you consider uh, raising the minimum project uh, cost threshold from $100,000 to $200,000 given, given the, the increase in prices of 
of, of all the projects that we're seeing across the board, that would have affected uh, all the projects identified there in, in yellow. They would not have been included on this list and they would simply have been presented to you in the respective office or department budget. And that's the, the final, final recommendation. Okay, do we need to take any formal uh, movement or motion to do that? I agree with you. I think the 100, it, it needs to be raised, I think. Mr. Fine. Chairman, Commissioner Kenyon, my, my thought, um, I don't know if others have, have uh, additional thoughts, but my thought is that we can bring you back the transformation board guidelines that specify this um, in, in the, the procedures. They do need to be updated to match our current program. They're, they're somewhat outdated. So we could bring that back to you for your consideration and you can make that change with that, that document. Okay. And I would just advise as you consider that, um, and for the reasons that Richard stated, in some ways that makes sense. Also, you would just likely end up seeing supplemental requests for each of these, mm -hmm. and you'd have to figure out here, you know, del during deliberations, how you would balance the supplemental requests against mm -hmm. the other requests. Mm -hmm. All right. And there is one more thing I almost forgot. Um, during the uh, sheriff's office presentation. Um, Chief Deputy uh, Dassault did indicate that one of their projects, the dispatch um, console system here in this building is no longer going to be pursued. So we did update this chart to remove that from uh, the calculation and it would look like this. And Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, I think that's all I have for you today. All right, are there any other questions from the, from the board? Are we, um, yes, Mr. Chair. So Phil, on the redigiting, is this the last year of the? Th this is year three of five, is that correct? Oh, year three of five, so we still have a few more to go. Yep. Okay. And you know, we've been able to fund it in previous years with increases in revenue due to uh, just recording fees. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just economic based on whether we can do that or, you know, this year we our revenues dropped because of the refinances, refinancings have dropped, so. Okay. So, so far it's going the, along as planned in terms of timing? Yes. Yeah, in terms of timing, it's going okay. just as planned. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners. Right. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I will uh, be brief. Um, uh, just kind of next steps, right? We're you know, hopefully, you know, the intention of each of these presentations and this week was really to gather as much information to be able to hopefully go through. I've seen you guys throughout going through your books, uh, hearing what the department's requests are and getting all that information. I think this is always one of the biggest challenges. You're never going to have all of the information you wish you had uh, to make decisions. Um, I know that is difficult to hear, but that is part of it. You know, the, this week has really been about, you know, I wish I knew or if I knew uh, next week is really the focus is now with what I know, uh, we have to start making decisions, right? And, and balancing all the various needs. Um, so we will be just like we have in the past using the Excel uh, balancing tool uh, to go over um, the information. I think you guys are familiar with the, the ball and, and we'll navigate through all of that, you know, um, we're a little bit hamstrung next week, at least that's how I'm feeling at the moment in terms of we've got the Juneteenth holiday, so we lost a, a day that we would typically have in that week. We're going to start in the afternoon on Tuesday. So I think Tuesday, you know, my recommendation to come in is to, to hit pretty strong and get as much done as we can on Tuesday, get through a lot of the big stuff. Um, I'll navigate some of the very easiest stuff first, just because some of it is more of a formality than anything, um, and then and get into as many decisions as we can. It's always tough for us because we want you to have all the time and tools to make uh, informed decisions. Um, but as you guys know even better than I, uh, we butt up against BOE. Uh, you've got that privilege coming ahead of you. Uh, and from what I hear, right, many applications coming in. So uh, it sounds like that will be a treat. Uh, and. So um, one of the things we'll go through, I, you know, just a, things to consider based on the directions that we gave departments and offices at the outset. Um, uh, we started with that FY22 base and then added that 3% increase on operating and minor capital. Um, given the 8.6 inflation rate we're at, you know, you heard Bob McQuaid, I think he said it well, 
It's a loss of buying power if you're not keeping up with that. Um, so I think just in terms of those bases, that may be a good safe place for us to start is uh, uh, being able to accept those base budgets unless there's particular projects or something baked in that you have a concern so that we can focus on the supplemental requests. Um, I'm gonna, uh, as I've already alluded and you've heard the theme throughout this week, I do think we should take up the personnel expenses first before we go wading in on all the supplementals and the operating stuff. That'll just give, that'll give us a foundation to start from. Uh, obviously that's a big expense. We can figure out where we are. If we need to adjust it later, we can, but it gives us a real foundation because the ball will move considerably when we do that. And then that, like we know we're, we're putting our highest priority. You've heard that theme throughout the week. That's the biggest priority. Get some numbers there. And then we can go through the, go through the new positions, right? After that, go through the supplemental operating requests um, and kind of work our way through all of those. Um, and Phil, I think, you know, we would just, you know, I don't want to speak for the board, but I, uh, I would like to encourage folks um, to know if we are looking at that higher COLA base amount at eight, nine percent, something like that, looking at the new positions and looking at their vacancies, you know, what would be their priorities? And if they have suggestions next week before we start cutting on where they would like us to, to, to cut, sure. that would be helpful, knowing that we can't do it all. All right, well, uh, we'll get a message out um, this, this afternoon just to everyone to say, hey, exactly to your point. I mean, as long as you guys, I think that seems you guys have kind of conveyed that throughout the week as well, saying knowing this, if you have anything. I mean, Jan did it, it was a good example. The um, there's been a few others where, or, you know, Tony in his fancy eraser. Mm -hmm. um, if everyone can get <laughs> their fancy erasers out, if Jake needs to help them. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. can be found in the public defender's office. Yeah. Same uh, with juvenile. I think Allison had a number of positions, and for us to know which ones are critical would yeah. be helpful. If yeah. they're, I think they were pretty close to all the same. I think they're all detention officers, so it may not matter on that one. But yeah, I think you are correct, though. Where there is going to be some um, uh, budding in terms of we only have so much money available, right? So we got to prioritize, and so if that's if that's the priority, let's fund it, and then we'll have to kind of chip away at uh, some of the other requests. Um, uh, I, I, I cut just because I heard it in passing. Um, we are looking at. Um, I was emailing with Ide Bailey earlier, uh, but just trying to figure out what those public defense, uh, what that money for public defense will be. I've mentioned that, so mm -hmm. I've, I've been. What Jake and I have been emailing this week as well. Um, I think I have a rough idea what that number will be, so we'll take that into consideration too as okay. a revenue stream okay. uh, when we discuss this. Um, uh, and I'll just mention just to plant the seed, you know, I, I'll probably bring it up next week just because I think it's something is, you know, when we do have that conversation about the COLA merit, um, I, I mentioned it when we met with the department heads and elected officials, but is the possibility of doing something one time now with, because we do have a, a sizable fund balance. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really part of the budget, but it kind of fits in this narrative because we're talking about pay increases in October, not anything that anyone will see now. So just something else to have in the back of your mind if you want to consider. Okay. Any, is there any information? I mean, it, you can easily reach us, right? But any information you want us to convey or anything, I mean, next week really will be decisions. And because we're starting on Tuesday afternoon, we're gonna, we're gonna have to be moving. Um, I, I do think, you know, the uh, sheriff's office and some of the other big players, we can have them available to answer questions. Sure. But a lot of this we need to, it's kind of now. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I, Bethany's working right now. Um, we talked at break on really taking a look at would there be any red flags if we did a higher eight or nine percent type of uh, okay. cola on top of the salary adjustments, on top of what was already given on bonuses this year, on top of um, promotions. Are there any red flags? Would you know somebody end up with just a way too large of an increase for one sure. year kind of questions. So I think she's kind of running through that for us. Well, I think along those lines, we've pulled up uh, numerous numbers, you know, just like uh, in addition to looking at that um, inflationary rate, like you can allude to, is looking at kind of what the model of the state did as well, where you do a, a portion that's percentage based, another portion that's a flat rate that might address some of the, that component without with avoiding some of the compression concerns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess, you know, just want to make sure I've got some numbers right going into the weekend. So um, fund balance, we're not looking at 28, we're looking at 25, is that correct? That's just, yes, and that's our being conservative. Okay, yeah, okay. And then um, we still have the 10 for ARPA. Yes, we do. Yep, that's yep. okay. And then um, question mark on the public defense piece that you just alluded to. 
Yeah, we will be getting the public defense money. It's the amount. Uh, it's probably in the nine million dollar range. Okay, and how right. we move it into the budget, though, and timing. When that. we get it, but but for the budget purposes, I think we can take that into consideration. We will get it. It's not. We've read the statute. We will get it. It's not clear when we'll get it, but it within the fiscal year it will happen. So I had uh, it six is to intended. Seven. Huh? I had six to seven, and you said it's closer to nine. Uh, let me follow up with you with more information, but I think it's probably closer to nine. Okay. And then we still have, we've got the new construction, uh, and the 3% hasn't changed, and then the department revenue in right. the base. <clears throat> yep. All right. Got our homework okay. cut out for us. <laughs> All right. All right. Next steps. Next steps. Yeah. See you guys Tuesday afternoon. Yep. And, and All right. enjoy the well, holiday. We'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.